afternoon and welcome to the April Forward Pinellas board meeting. Uh, let's uh, call the meeting to order, please, and do a roll call. We usually just do. Yeah. Are you asking for introductions around the room? Yes. yes. Uh, let's start with Mayor Bajowski. Julie Ward Bajowski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. Patrick R. County Commission, District 2. David Albritton, Vice Mayor, City of Clearwater. Michael Smith, Commissioner, City of Largo. Whit Blanton, Executive Director. Dave Eggers, Pinellas County Commission. Commissioner Cliff Mers, representing the City of Safety Harbor, Oldsmar, and Tarpon Springs. Brandy Gabbard, City of St. Petersburg. And I'm Darden Rice from the City of St. Petersburg and your chair today. Uh, we have board members here in the room, but some staff, presenters, and members of the public will be joining us via Zoom as well today. At this time, if those in the room would please stand for the invocation and pledge, Commissioner Mers will give the invocation and lead us in the pledge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please join me in the invocation. Creator God, we ask your blessings while we gather here today to conduct the business of local government, the deliberative body that is closest to the people. It is incumbent upon those gathered here to make the best decisions possible for our community. In this regard, help guide this governing body to use reason, wisdom, and empathy in their deliberations and to take into account the implications that these decisions will have now and into the future. Let us be gathered here to move our community forward in a spirit of mutual respect and common decency. We unite here today around that noble aim and common purpose. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner. My pleasure. Before we move on with the agenda, we will have our process coordinator, Tina Jablon, outline the procedures that will be followed for public comment today. Tina, will you please state the procedures? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll take the next few minutes to review the process that has been devised for this meeting. There will be a technology moderator and a process coordinator who will be tasked with facilitating the in-person and Zoom portions of the meeting. The technology moderator will be Sarah Caper, principal planner with Forward Pinellas, and she will be facilitating the Zoom portions of the meeting today. The process coordinator will be myself, Tina Jablon, Executive Administrative Secretary for Forward Pinellas, and I will be facilitating the in-person portions of the meeting. Any person may be heard by the Forward Pinellas Board for not more than three minutes on any proposition before the board, unless such time is modified by the chair. The options and methods for doing that will be explained in a moment. To ensure an accurate record of the meeting, when addressing the board, the speaker must first state and spell his or her name and state their address and announce what agenda item they will be speaking to. Throughout the meeting, we ask that all presenters and speakers identify themselves by name each time that they speak unless they have been properly introduced by the chair. Additionally, please be mindful of not speaking over one another. Prior to a vote on any matter, the chair will seek public comment. The chair will inquire of the technology moderator in Zoom to see if there are members of the public wishing to address the board. The technology moderator will ask for a virtual hand raising for all those in Zoom wishing to speak. The number of people in the room and with their hands raised in Zoom will be noted to the chair. Each person will be given three minutes to address the board or time as modified by the chair for all speakers. Those present in the room will speak first, followed by those in Zoom. Finally, the chair may seek more information from Forward Pinellas staff, the presenter, or other sources before entering a motion and vote. The majority of Forward Pinellas staff and presenters will be participating today via Zoom. 
We ask that everyone please silence all their cell phones and other noise-making devices and allow presentations to be completed in their entirety before questions or comments. And with that, Council Member Rice, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. So we're on uh, agenda item three, which is citizens to be heard. If there are any citizens wishing to be heard on any, any items that's not already on the agenda for action by the board today. Uh, Tina, do we have anyone in the room or anyone in Zoom who wishes to speak? Madam Chair, there's no one in the room for citizens to be heard today. And I'm sorry, let me check with Sarah. Sarah, is there anyone, uh, any member of the public in Zoom who wishes to speak? Any member of the public in Zoom who wishes to speak on any items not already on the agenda for action by the board today, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button in Zoom, or if you're calling in, press star nine on the phone at this time. There is no one wishing to speak at this time. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the consent agenda, item number four. Uh, do any members uh, wish to pull any items from the consent agenda to be handled individually? Okay, seeing none. Uh, Move to approve agenda Second. item four. Second. Okay, thank you. Um, Sarah, do we have any members of the public in Zoom who wish to speak to the consent agenda? Any members of the public who wish to speak in Zoom on the consent agenda, please use the raise hand button in Zoom at this time. Or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. There is no one wishing to speak on this item. And do we have anyone in the room who wishes to speak on the consent agenda? There is no one in the room wishing to speak on the consent agenda. Okay. Um, thank you. So again, we don't have any board members who have uh, asked to pull any items and we have a motion and a second on the floor. Um, so um, 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 now we'll vote to approve the agenda. All in, all, in uh, all who approve, vote yay. Aye. 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 Any, any against? Okay, that passes unanimously, thank you. Our next item is 5A, the PSTA activities report. Um, that will be given by Commissioner Gerard. Thank you. The uh, PSTA board met on March 31st. We talked about a bus on shoulder pilot project that we're doing with FDOT, uh, which will have PSTA buses using the outside shoulder between on a five mile segment between 22nd Avenue and Gandhi Boulevard. Um, and you should probably already be seeing the signs of that happening. Uh, that will be starting soon, in June actually. Uh, we'll hear more about waterborne transportation at this meeting, but we've begun a detailed analysis of the first phase of that. Um, and we'll continue to work with Forward Pinellas, City Clearwater and Dunedin and the county on having a concept design uh, to apply for an FTA passenger grant, or passenger ferry grant, sorry. Um, we approved an interlocal agreement with the city of Dunedin to launch the next phase of the autonomous vehicle demonstration program to start in May. Um, and we've, been, we've had our employees and their families getting vaccinated by community health centers of Pinellas um, and we really appreciate their coming out to the site and doing that very early in the morning. Um, last month, I didn't get to make our presentation, but we did have a, um, we approved a, a new contract for transportation disadvantage last month, which um, is a long-term, a huge contract and long-term, and I forgot the name of the company that we're, <laughs> that we're contracting with. We also had a presentation this month, this month on Jolly Trolley uh, a new 10-year contract for that, which we'll be approving at next month's meeting. We're not approving, whatever. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Chair, if I may, I'd like to just uh, let the board know that we're inviting PSTA to come and make a uh, presentation at our next meeting in May uh, on kind of an overview of some of the things that they're implementing. Um, I think you'd like to hear about the pro progress on the Sunrunner bus rapid transit project. 
uh, the Waterborne and Ava in particular, but um, I think it's good once or twice a year to have PSTA come and give us an update um, in, in a little more depth uh, on some of their ongoing activities. And this was a suggestion that Commissioner Seal made uh, to me after a presentation to one of our advisory committees that she sat in on. So I think it's a good idea and we'll try to do that a couple of times a year. Yeah, I think we should ask him to talk about the bus on shoulder thing too. So as many people as possible know what's happening there. Any other comments or questions on PSTA? Okay, thank you for that report, Commissioner Gerard. We'll move on to 5B, the T-BARDA activities report to be given by Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I will try very hard to be brief because there's been a lot going on at T-BARDA over the last month and a half. Uh, because of some legislation that was introduced, I think I spoke about it last month by Senator Brandis to abolish T-BARDA. We've had considerable discussions on the board about that, and we've spent quite a bit of time talking about the last three years of T-BARDA, how we have focused very much on the legislative requirements that we were asked to do by the Florida legislature, and I'm happy to let you know that we accomplished all of them. Uh, on top of that, there was also an effort to, def to defund T-BARDA. Well, we don't get legislative dollars for T-BARDA anyway, and when we do, it's from non-recurring sources. And so we had a million and a half dollars request in the legislature, and because of this bill that Brandis filed, it was going to be very difficult to continue advocating for that. So we pulled back on that a little bit and focused more on trying to implement some tweaks to transportation policy and how it's funded. And as we were working on that, lo and behold, the president of the Senate put in a million and a half dollars in the conference budget. Mm -hmm. And so now all of that will be resolved during the conferees when they meet uh, over this next two weeks. So stay tuned on that. At the same time, because of the spotlight that Senator Brandis forced on T. Barta, we decided that we were going to re take a really hard look at our current T. Barta budget. And we do, re, 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 excuse me, we reduced the annual operating budget from seven million down to uh, $2 million. So we took five million out of the budget in a precautionary um, move and to more focus on the 11 million that we had in 5307 monies from the feds because that money, there are some things we can do with it. And if we do it properly and dot the I's and cross the T's, we'll be able to pay for a lot of the operating issues out of the 5307 money. Commissioner Seal is shaking her head because she knows all about the different pots, and I'm sorry she's not still with us on T. Barta. Anyway, so the motion was made, and they, the Finance Committee had an emergency meeting a couple weeks ago, and they did um, support the new and revised budget and the way that we are going to operate going forward. And on top of that, some of you heard me say in the legislative meeting that Doyle and I have been having ongoing discussions with the folks at the Secretary of Transportation right in Pete Buttigieg's office. And we have a statewide listening tour that we've been planning in collaboration with the Florida Association of Counties to ensure that all of the cities, and I know there are several mayors here today visiting with us, will be able to participate and share their transportation woes and uh, feelings and thoughts about how we move forward, not only within our county, but throughout our state. So stay tuned, there's lots more to come, and I'm very hopeful for the future, given the new infrastructure package of the new administration. Hopefully, we've been talking about it for years now, decades even, maybe we'll finally bring it to fruition, because God knows the whole country can use it. Thank you. Thank you for the report, Commissioner Long. Does anyone have questions or comments about the T-BARDA report? An update? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll move 
on to the next item. And um, if we could, please, board members, let's just hold our questions until after the presentations are completed. We'll move on to item 5C. This is our transit-oriented development update from Christina Mendoza of Forward Pinellas. Sarah Caper will share the screen and um, Christina will give the report. Hi, thank you everyone. I'm just requesting control right now. All right, thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Christina Mendoza and I am a principal planner with Bard Pinellas. So as most of you probably already know, uh, through our partnerships with agencies and organizations throughout the county, uh, we often identify topics that need to be further examined as a research project. So our agency has been conducting research on transit-oriented development, or TOD, as it relates to Pinellas County and surrounding areas. So some of you may be asking, what is TOD, right? Well, it's defined as a type of development that typically includes a mix of uses, such as residential, commercial, or office uses, with pedestrian amenities and within a half mile of public transportation. Around the world, TOD has developed into a planning, community development, design, and funding method that allows for the creation of development patterns that support livable and walkable environments. Within Pinellas County, the incorporation of TOD is encouraged through the most recent updates to the countywide plan to, um, to promote increased densities and intensities along priority transit corridors. By prioritizing these investment corridors in Advantage Pinellas, they will be prioritized to receive funding, which will support the incorporation of transit service as well as TOD efforts. It's also encouraged through the most through local adoption of transit supportive land development regulations by municipalities. So as part of our research efforts, our team conducted a site visit to Lake Mary, Florida to learn more about the city's TOD projects located along the SunRail corridor. We developed a white paper and video that highlights our research efforts. Key topics covered include the benefits of TOD, challenges and opportunities to implementation, TOD projects across America, TOD projects in Florida, next steps for TOD in Pinellas County, and key TOD resources cited in the report for reference. So the incorporation of TOD will address changing trends. It combines land use and transportation planning. It enhances mobility and accessibility. It can reduce reliance on vehicular travel and it promotes pedestrian scale development. So why do we build TOD? Because now more than ever, people are looking for housing and transportation options that are accessible and affordable. And the need for livable, transit accessible communities is continuously increasing. The supply does not meet the demand. So we also looked at some challenges and opportunities to the implementation of TOD. And one of these challenges includes locating it. Connectivity is a key component for successful TOD, and it's often difficult to create the environment where it's needed most, such as in suburban areas. It's important for communities to implement TOD supportive land use policies that allow for increased densities that can support TOD. Another challenge is often the market conditions in an area, which can be a challenge when they're not supportive of mixed use development at the scale and intensity that's desired for TOD projects. They often require creative financial structuring to fund the mix of uses. TOD efforts may also require existing transit service expansion. There's an opportunity to capture increased property values when premium transit service is incorporated along a corridor. And this funding strategy is known as value capture. A portion of that increased value can then be used for funding transit service infrastructure. The last challenge is often the effect on equity. When TOD is incorporated into an area, um, it can cause um, now the, the area now to have enhanced transit access, and that can cause um, property values to increase, which can often cause those living in a neighborhood to be priced out of the area. So um, in order to remedy that, it's really important for communities to consider the incorporation of strategies 
um, such as mixed income housing strategies and policies that would allow for the um, market rate rents of housing units to offset the workforce lower rent um, so they can cross subsidize each other. So we also looked at TOD examples across America to see what we could learn from other places. And for the purposes of brevity today, I will just stick with the first example. So we looked at the city of Cleveland, Ohio, which has established TOD around its bus rapid transit system. Known as the Health Line, the system connects two of the largest regional employment centers and runs along the Euclid corridor. It has generated more than 9.5 billion in economic development and reinvestment along the Euclid corridor and over 5.8 billion in total TOD investment. And this effort was the result of the city partnering with really strong um, community development corporations, agencies and foundations to promote development along the corridor as well as a really strong political support for the project. Uh, a TOD scorecard an implementation plan was also created uh, to help prioritize projects and investments and help to facilitate TOD around the region. In addition to Cleveland, we also looked at Austin, Texas and Charlotte, North Carolina as examples. And within Florida and at the county level, uh, TOD projects are currently underway. Howard Pinellas is working with PSTA and the cities of St. Petersburg and South Pasadena on a TOD strategic plan for the Sunrunner Bus Rapid <laughs> Transit Corridor. The Sunrunner will provide access from downtown St. Petersburg through South Pasadena to St. Pete Beach, and construction of the station areas is currently underway. PSTA was awarded a $1.2 million grant from the Federal Transit Administration for the TOD strategic plan. The plan will focus on examining land use patterns surrounding the corridor and station areas. And the goal of the plan is to encourage TOD supportive development along the corridor while supporting the success of existing and future businesses and creating a destination for both residents and visitors. So much of the project thus far has focused on public outreach and business assistance. The consultant has conducted an existing conditions and market analysis and has developed a TOD characteristic toolkit and place types and readiness criteria. So the proposed place type framework can be seen on the slide. We've identified four place types for use along the corridor, downtown, urban, village, and neighborhood, <clears throat> excuse me, which are being used to characterize the type of development along specific areas of the corridor, which will be used to develop the station area plan. So next steps for the project include continued development of the redevelopment vision, development of the station area and corridor TOD, TOD framework plan, and development of the implementation plan. Public engagement efforts include business assistance engagement, a developers forum, and virtual community workshops that are planned for this spring and summer. So to continue to foster efforts such as the Sunrunner TOD strategic plan, it's important for local governments to understand their role in the process and how they can encourage the incorporation of TOD within their communities. We've identified several recommendations for local government. The first is to review the countywide plan to determine the potential locations of activity centers and multimodal corridors within each respective city as identified in the land use strategy map. Review comprehensive plans to identify potential limitations to TOD and amend policies accordingly. Consider the incorporation of TOD supportive land development regulations within local comprehensive plans. And identify potential development incentives that can be used locally to create equitable TOD projects along priority investment corridors. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christina. So um, we don't uh, need to take action today, but um, we do want to have questions and discussion. So uh, does any member of the board have some comments and questions? Yes, Commissioner Eggers. Hi, Christina. Uh, thank you for that, uh, for that report. Just a, just a couple questions, really. Um, you know, as we uh, look to develop these corridors and have intensity be 
you know, the development intensity go up and land values go up. And it seems that we're getting an abundance of apartment complexes, which in themselves aren't bad. I mean, we need those apartment complexes. They're filling up pretty well. I think it does hurt some of our efforts on the affordable housing front. Um, but just in general, how do you how do you think about what what can we do to ensure a little bit more balanced commercial presence along some of those corridors, um, rather than just going after the highest and best use as far as in, uh, cost goes, which tends towards apartments. Um, I think the best approach to that, if I understand your question. Um, is I mean that's that's essentially largely what the what the local land development regulations where they come into play as far as that goes what's allowed um, and what's approved. Um, I don't know if Rodney has some thoughts. He's actually on here as well as to how we could approach that. Yeah, Christina, uh, Rodney Chapman, Planning Manager for Pinellas. Uh, I would also add that in our um, early steps of the TLD planning effort, we had a market uh, consultant conduct an analysis of the existing demand for various types of land uses along the corridor. And so that gave us a good insight as to uh, your point about perhaps too much residential and not enough other uses. Uh, because what we, set, what we found was in some cases, there is a higher demand for more office space along uh, the BRT corridor, for example. And so we will work with uh, the partner communities to calibrate the, the zoning and the land development regulations to incentivize and tap into that market demand for those uses besides residential. I would also add, in my experience, uh, Commissioner, has been that um, sort of commercial follows rooftops. And what I mean by that is as you have more people that live in, along a certain corridor or, or an area, those, um, those rooftops become um, essentially consumers for various goods and services. So uh, we fully believe that as you get more residential along certain corridors, you will start to see uh, higher demand for uh, services to support uh, where people are now living. Yeah, I, yeah thank you, Rodney, for those comments. I, I, you know, I do think, you know, two things. One is uh, the uh, commercial following rooftops. There is some validity to that, but we've got to make sure that we're setting aside area for that because these these highly in, you know intense uh, apartment complexes tend to drive the the economic model right now and to that same point i think you're, you're going to see that in the office market too it's soft right now um, and uh, it, it goes through cycles and there's going to be a time when we need more office space and i wonder about the land that's going to be available to accommodate that so i, I just think as we go forward some of that, as you said, Christina, some of that land planning that needs to go on needs to set aside some areas for that. It can be the second layer. It can be, you know, along the corridor itself or behind it or whatever. But we need to provide some thought processes in that long-term view versus just what in the next year or two makes the most financial sense. Because just because Pinellas County, we just don't have the land, as, you, as, as we've said. So thank you. Appreciate the, uh, the responses. If I could add something to that <clears throat> real briefly, you know, really good TOD, you've got to take a corridor approach, and the station areas can really be differentiated. You don't need to have every station a perfect mixed use. So uh, a good example of that would be Arlington, uh, Virginia, the Arlington, Roslyn, Boston corridor, where um, they have one station area, the courthouse, which is more government and office building and a little bit of multifamily and things like that. Then you go a little further in to, um, to Roslyn and it's much more residential and it's got supportive commercial. And then you go to the next station over and it's got more of, of something else, um, more, more commercial and, and less of office and retail. And having those different station areas in that example has really uh, created destinations. So when people seek those things out, they can pick that station area. So I, I wanna caution uh, against thinking that you have to have everything within one station area. If you've got multiple stations along the corridor, um, it really makes travel between the stations that much more desirable and attractive. 
but your point's real well taken about preserving land. And one thing local governments also do is require ground floor retail, for instance, so that you create that walkable, attractive amenity, which is crucial for TOD to be successful. Uh, Commissioner Seal. I am so happy to finally see us moving forward on TOD. We have talked about this for years and years and years, and it is um, very important to the whole future development of Pinellas County that we get this in place and get it right. So um, this should be very exciting to see what PSTA does and keeping us involved too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Bojowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, th I think this is really a question for Wit, and I don't want to take us off topic, but um, <coughs> I, I too am very excited about the transit-oriented development and how we're going to do this. I'm curious as to where we are uh, on the St. Pete Beach and Pasadena, South Pasadena front, because I, I see stations and I see stuff there, and I know it's been an ongoing thing, and I don't mean to bring up a sore subject, but... Not a sore subject at all. I mean, uh, all three of the cities along that line want redevelopment. Uh, they want redevelopment that's scaled uh, and appropriate for their communities. Uh, they weren't all in favor of the, of the bus rapid transit project as a, as a catalyst for redevelopment. But I think that's the common ground we can find, is that there's a desire for um, strengthening their cores and uh, creating a little more commercial and residential and uh, otherwise vibrancy uh, in those communities. Um, so our aim is to you know, work with them very closely and, and bring forward concepts and ideas and um, recommendations that fit their context um, so that they can be they can, they can see the benefits of the Sunrun or BRT. Even if they didn't want the project, maybe there's some other aspects of it that they'll benefit from and enjoy. Uh, one thing I'd also like to just mention is that we've kind of enabled TOD in the right locations in the county, consistent with our investment corridors that were adopted in the long range plan. And it's really up to the local governments to take advantage of the opportunity we've created. So we're not forcing TOD on anybody. We're not forcing high densities in any particular location. Um, but if a community wants to take advantage of that, then they don't have us as an impediment. They have us as a resource uh, for that because we've enabled it. And Largo, when they did the Tri-Cities plan, didn't use all the density that we enabled uh, in that location, but they used what they felt was needed for their community and for that context. And that's exactly how it needs to work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I have a few comments and questions. So thank you, Rodney, and thank you, Christina. I, I wanna be sure that we don't bury the lead here. And Rodney had mentioned rooftops, but I know in St. Pete, it seems like they're a part of the discussion has been where we can use transit-oriented development to focus on greater density. And so I, I think the rooftops is really important. And um, again, this doesn't have to be the exact same concept at every stop, but I think that some of the conversations that the city has been having with our Vision 2050 process is certainly looking at those opportunities where we can tweak um, density and do a little bit of upzoning in these areas uh, along transit corridors. Um, I noticed that some of the examples of transit-oriented development were cities that have rail lines. Are there any examples of cities that have successfully done TOD with BRT stops? Uh, yes, actually the Cleveland example I cited oh. was a BRT system. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry, I didn't catch that. That's okay. I, is that, did they have a different experience with it? I mean, I remember a few years ago, it seemed like there was an emphasis that development would follow fixed guideway, but not necessarily bus lines. But it, do we have to kind of pursue this differently with BRT or is it different financing? Is it a different, it, it, I mean, it's gotta be a little bit of a different animal, right? It is, I would say it, it definitely, it, the approach is slightly different. Um, the, why Cleveland was so successful was because they, they really partnered with the right people. Um, you know, they, they actually, their story is really interesting because it all occurred 
around 2008 when the economy was really bad mm -hmm. um, and still the city managed to um, leverage that $5 million per mile transit investment to $5.8 billion in, the, in new TOD development. Um, you know, it's important to note that it didn't occur because of the transit investment itself. You know, the city made a dedicated effort to channel development to this corridor. Um, and their example is cited in one of the research reports that I read entitled More Development for Your Transit Dollar, which is released by the Institute of Development um, and Transportation Policy. And they're a really great example for that. Um, and so I would say it managed to partner with the right people, which included, you know, the strong community development corporations, private foundations and agencies. And the political support for the project, I think, was was key to that as well. It allowed them to have more access to different diverse funding options, and they were able to assemble land, and they were able to work closely with the developers. And all, all of those elements were really key to the success of their line. Okay, that's great to know. And then um, another question I have is about a term you used, uh, value capture. And if I understand that correctly, and please correct me or fill in the blanks if I don't, I see value capture as almost being a, a mini TIF district in uh, a transit-oriented development corridor or a stop. Is that kind of going in the right direction there? Yes, yes. A TIF, TIF district is a type of value capture method. Okay. And that's tax increment financing for those who don't follow acronyms. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you. I, I'd like to address your first comment on the difference between rail and bus, and we do have Cassandra Borchers from PSTA who may be able to speak to that, but you know, the goal of, of bus rapid transit is to emulate uh, fixed guideway as much as possible, and federal rules require that um, to be competitive for certain types of grant, you have grants, you have to have 50% of your BRT as in, in a dedicated lane or fixed guideway. So mm -hmm. it, it does kind of mimic rail in, mm -hmm. in that respect. Cassandra, is there anything more you'd like to add if you're available? There she is. Good afternoon. Um, yes, I'll just add that uh, the Sunrunner BRT is considered fixed guideway and you will see the bus and turn lanes starting to be constructed um, on First Avenue North and, and South, uh, as well as Pasadena Avenue. Um, and these will be have a red lane treatment to identify them as bus lanes that also do allow for turning movements. Um, but this does create the sense of permanence that is equivalent to a rail line. And so we anticipate that we will be able to have some su su successful TOD as part of this project. That's, thank you. That's a really excellent point. Um, thank you, Cassandra. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, well, thank you very much, Christina and Rodney. We will move on to our next item. This is item 5D. It's a draft multimodal priorities discussion. We'll hear from Chelsea Favreau of our Forward Pinellas staff. And we also, um, excuse me just a moment. We also have some guests in the audience today. Uh, Mayor Serrano from Indian Shores is here, and when we bring you up, we'll have you uh, introduce the Indian Shores contingent today, but thank you for being here. And um, please uh, continue with the presentation, Chelsea. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So today I'll be presenting on the draft 2021 priority list. Um, so each year we bring you the multimodal priority list for your review, comment, and then ultimately for your approval. Uh, again, this is done on an annual basis so that we have the opportunity to update the projects uh, that are on the list, take off projects that have been completed, and also add new projects to the list. Uh, I will remind everyone, uh, we do have some what we call off the top priorities where this board uh, took a policy position 
to uh, each year advance funding for transit capital projects, for complete streets projects, uh, and the like through the Advantage Pinellas plan. So you will see some of the newer projects that we're adding to the list are higher than some of the existing priorities. And that is because when FDOT, the Florida Department of Transportation, looks at our priority list, we want them to fund those projects first. They're lower cost or lower dollar amount projects uh, that come off the top. Uh, projects do remain on the list until they are completed, and that's why you're going to see two tiers uh, in the priority list in your packet. Uh, the top tier, those are not numbered. They just have the letter P for programmed, and those remain on the list just in case something comes up and they need a little bit of extra funding. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation is easily able to do that because they do remain on the priority list. And then the new projects that we're adding this year are being added according to the scoring process that you all approved uh, in 2020. So prior to last year, when we uh, added new projects to the priority list, it was more of a, a policy position as to how, what projects we selected to add and in what order they went. Uh, during the course of 2020, we worked with our technical committee, our bicycle pedestrian advisory committee, and you all to come up with a new uh, project selection process. So we issued a call for projects last year, and we did receive three applications through that call for projects. And then we scored those applications according to the criteria that you see up on the screen. Uh, understanding that safety, equity, and health and mobility are some of our highest priorities as an agency, we did assign more weight uh, to the points in those areas. And then we also considered economics, environment, and resiliency. So that's just a little reminder about some of the new projects you're going to see being added to the list and how they got where they are located. Uh, when we did that call for projects, uh, we did uh, have a minimum project cost of $350,000. Uh, knowing that it can often cost, it takes a lot of time and energy to put together a project application and then get it all the way through the process. We wanted to make sure that we weren't advancing projects that cost more money to process than it does to build them. Uh, we did consider all modes of transportation through that calls of, call for projects with the exception of bike ped standalone projects. While we developed the 2045 Advantage Pinellas plan, we also developed an active transportation plan. And in that active transportation plan, we identified a number of corridors for bicycle and pedestrian improvements, namely multi-use trails and also overpasses. And we committed to advancing those projects uh, through the priority list. So you'll see on the priority list, we do have some bike ped projects that are being advanced, but we wanted to make sure that since we went through this whole process to come up with a prioritized list of bike ped projects and a commitment to advance them, we didn't have other bike ped projects kind of jumping the queue uh, and, and ending up with a priority list. And then we were proposing to advance them in ranges. Uh, so you will not see points assigned to the brand new projects, uh, but there will be a notation as to if they had a high score, medium high, a medium or a low. So going to the priority list and some of the major changes, there are three projects that are being proposed to be removed from the priority list. Uh, two of them are along the Alt US 19 corridor. These two projects were really placeholders uh, while the corridor study was underway uh, and you know, until uh, individual projects could be identified that could be added to the list later. Uh, so we're working with staff from each of the cities to identify what those specific projects are and to get them advanced on the priority list. One of the new projects uh, that you'll see at Alt-19 um, and the Causeway intersection, that is a direct result from this study that's then being advanced as an individual project. So for now, we're looking to take the placeholders off so that they can be replaced with implementable projects. Uh, in addition to that, the Aerial Transit Feasibility and Operations Plan uh, that is currently underway through TBARDA. So it does not need to be on the priority list anymore. So that is being proposed for removal as well. <coughs> we have four projects that received funding, uh, full funding. So they are being moved from the numbered portion of the list up to the program portion of the list. Uh, one of those is the Skinner Boulevard Complete Streets project that received construction funding in 2026. Uh, Sunrunner, as was just discussed, is currently under construction. Uh, the Drew Street Operational and Safety Improvements, uh, there is a feasibility uh, and engineering study underway right now with design funding in 22 and construction funding in 24. And then that Alt-19 project, the Causeway Intersection uh, design build is scheduled for that in 2023. So those will be moved up. 
Uh, unfortunately, uh, there was one project that was formally funded for construction that no longer is. Uh, that is the I-275 from 54th Avenue South up to Roosevelt Boulevard. That includes lane continuity improvements along the entire length of the corridor, as well as express lanes from I-375 up to Gandhi. Uh, the funding was removed from the work program, so we did put it back down on the priority list at a relatively high ranking uh, so that when DOT you know, works their magic and gets funding back on this project, it's up there. Uh, and we're very hopeful that we'll be able to work uh, closely with the department to get this project uh, moving again uh, back into the work program. In terms of our new project priorities, uh, the first one is uh, the 22nd Street Complete Streets Construction Project in St. Petersburg. Uh, this was the annual Complete Streets priority uh, for construction funding. So this is being added, again, very close to the top of the list because it is a million dollars off the top. And then the next three that we're proposing to add are the result of our call, call for projects. The first, uh, we received an application from TBARTA for capital funding to expand their van pool. Uh, we did identify regional transit as an off the top priority uh, in Advantage Pinellas. So we are proposing to add this higher up on the list so that DOT can look at it first and advance it for funding. Uh, this is an expansion to the van pool program in Pinellas County. This would not be replacement funding uh, for any of the van pools that currently exist. The second uh, is the Cross Bay Ferry. Uh, the city of St. Petersburg requested capital funding. Uh, when we went through the scoring process, this did receive the highest score. Uh, and then the following project is the Martin Luther King uh, Boulevard South improvements from 30th Avenue South to 7th Avenue South in St. Petersburg. And this received a medium high score in the competitive scoring process. So when you see these two added to the list, they'll be in that order. We ensured that the Cross Bay Ferry was listed above the MLK just because of the, the scoring it did receive. Uh, we're also proposing to add the next two projects from the active transportation plan. Uh, these are the ones that we committed to advancing incrementally uh, onto the priority list. The first is a trail along the 28th Street corridor from 30th Avenue North up to Roosevelt Boulevard. This would include a mix of multi-use trail and bicycle boulevard treatments, uh, depending on the context of the corridor and the ability to fit it in uh, where right away is constrained. And then in addition to that, we're also gonna be prioritizing an overpass for the Duke Energy Trail near Roosevelt Boulevard and the Carillon Center. Uh, one additional project that you will not see in the, in the presentation or on the list today is an additional waterborne transportation project. Uh, there is currently some discussion about uh, some capital funding for expanding ferry service in the northern portion of Pinellas County along the intercoastal. The details of that are still being worked out. Uh, until we get those details finalized, it just wasn't ready to go on today, but we're gonna be having those conversations in the coming weeks as we finalize the list. So today we're really looking for uh, your review and comment on the list. Uh, we will be taking this final list uh, to our committees later on this month, and it'll be brought back to you for final action at your meeting next month. After you take final action, we'll be transmitting it to the Florida Department of Transportation, and they'll use it uh, as they develop the next five-year work program. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Chelsea. Can I just add, mm -hmm. um, you know, all this is a little bit contingent on the Florida legislative session. And so we are hopeful that the legislature will work with the department, keep the work program uh, that we had adopted uh, as of July 1 intact. And that's the I-275 segment two that Chelsea mentioned along with the West Shore interchange and along with um, some design and right of way money that was on the Northern US 19 uh, corridor here in Pinellas County. Those were all on the strategic intermodal system and got tentatively moved out of the work program because of the COVID budget impacts. Um, we're optimistic that that'll be remedied uh, in the next few weeks and we'll have an announcement soon, at least on one or more of those. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the Waterborne Transportation Committee that met on April 2nd uh, voted to recommend that this board add the Clearwater Ferry uh, Water Taxi Capital Program. And we're looking to apply for a federal grant and we're trying to figure out what local match uh, might be best suited for that federal grant for that program. So that'll be something for discussion um, at your May meeting. But I did wanna just let you know that that was a recommendation of the Waterborne Committee. Thank you. Mayor Kennedy. Hi. Um, and I wanted just to second that because I, I did actually think that 
even though we didn't have all our ducks in a row, um, that we are working very hard on applying for the grants. Um, and we do want to be considered, whether it's next month or whenever it comes back again, to be on the priority li list as far as the waterborne transportation. As you remember, this board put the waterborne transportation committee together so that we could study and come up with a plan for the future of waterborne transportation. So I, I, I do want to make sure that um, we just we just had our meeting and we're very excited about some of the uh, some of the plans and the grants that we are going to be going after. So I, I do want to make sure that that's on there, and, and that you you keep that in mind for the next meeting. Thank you. Yes, Mayor Bajowski. In support of our chair of the Waterborne Transportation Committee, I want to ask, what, why can't it be on here now? Or for May? Um, well, for May is what we're intending. So okay. um, I, I just I, want, I wanted to hear you say that. Yeah, I mean, okay. that's the recommendation. So it's going to be up to the board okay. to decide right whether to add it. <laughs> I, I think some of our hesitancy is uh, until we know exactly what the project will do and where the local match will come from, you know, it's we don't like putting projects on the priority list that are um, kind of a wish list and a hope and a dream. So we want it to be a little more concrete. Uh, and I think PSTA uh, and their capital analysis that they're doing will come into a little more focus as we get closer to May to, to enable that to happen. Okay, so it'll be on our May list. Thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Seal. Thank you. I have several questions. Um, what is going to be proposed at all US 19 and Bayshore intersection improvement to be cons um, done in 2023? I mean, we've studied this. We've altered it. We've done so many different things to this intersection. What now? Not that I don't think something's needed, but I'm just curious. Alt US 19 and Causeway, Bayshore, is that up in Dunedin, what you're asking about? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know exactly. Um, so it, there are three alternatives that came out of the corridor study. And by doing the design uh, in 2022, as Chelsea indicated, that'll flesh out those, those alternatives. But they are essentially innovative intersection approaches there to maximize the green time. Uh, for the different movements that we have and provide more pedestrian and bicycle safety because those blank out signs uh, are, are violated a lot when we have the right turns. Um, so it's a combination of things. Um, so the department will be evaluating the available right of way and the feasibility of those different alternatives. Displace left turn, I think, was one that we looked at and um, another type of innovative intersection was, it, was considered in that corridor study. Okay. Uh, my next question is the status of the Duke Trail overpass at State Road 60, which is priority number five. Um, all it has is NA, NA, NA. Um, where, what is the status on that and why would we add more overpasses and more trails, meaning the overpass at Roosevelt and the trail on 28th Street North without completing some of these other priorities first? Um, Chelsea, I don't know if you have an answer for that one specifically because I'm not sure mm -hmm. I do. I do. Um, so we have been working with Pinellas County and the Department of Transportation on that overpass. Uh, the Florida Department of Transportation has offered to do an al uh, feasibility alignment uh, in-house. So they're going to be moving ahead with that in the, in the coming months. Uh, just so that we can get an initial look of you know, how we can even get an overpass at that location. Uh, the 18th Avenue South corridor that's already on there, we've been working with the city of St. Petersburg and the department to finalize uh, kind of the plans for next steps on that. So those are all actually already in a stage of moving forward. And that's why we thought now is probably a good time to get the other projects on there so that they can be next up in the queue. Also, if there is any uh, federal or state stimulus funding uh, that's coming in for transportation priorities, uh, we've been hearing that multimodal uh, accessibility is going to be a key factor in how those projects are evaluated. So it made sense to have a few additional options on the list this year uh, versus waiting until next year when there may not be an opportunity for that stimulus funding. Okay. And this 
question might be better for Pinellas County, but I know when we talked about the Duke Energy Trail under construction in North County that crosses State Road 580, the commission indicated that we were interested in looking at an overpass there because of the amount of traffic. And this shows up, I mean, is this a question that I should be going back to the county and saying, what happened? <laughs> or is it better to be coming through you all? Uh, it's probably a combination, and we'll certainly include that in our coordination meeting with county staff. Um, my understanding is, you know, it will open with a um, um, a flashing beacon for now, and then we'll add the overpass in time. Um, so it's something that they could either submit as an application in next year's call for projects, and we could prioritize it then, or we could pursue it a different way. Okay. I mean, only because, you know, we're adding, we haven't even constructed down near Roosevelt, so in Carillon, so to be putting an overpass in the queue when we haven't addressed what's already going to be open very soon to the public and could be definitely a hazard. Um, and it was a priority that the commission discussed at our meeting way back. So um, anyway, I'll, I'll go work on it from the Pinellas County end. But okay. Um, okay, that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rickers? Well, <clears throat> mine will be short because the two I had were overpass at the causeway and overpass at 580. Uh, both of them critically important. I mean, I think the one at 580, I think we're just, um, when you go down to the one in Skinner Boulevard, I mean, it's just, it's busy and you are really slowing traffic down, but we are getting at the end of the 580 corridor there and it's, it's starting to slow down anyway. And we're going to be likely adding a roundabout and really slowing the traffic down. It's a little different story there. Up there on 580, we've really worked at moving traffic on a state road, and I think that's going to create a real problem. And I know it's not just going to be a flashing yellow there. It'll probably be a, a light, but we have lights just to the east and just to the west, so you're introducing another light, and I think you're going to have a lot of safety issues and a lot of traffic issues there. So we did make that a priority. Both of those actually were made a priority, and I, I just wanted to echo those comments. So thank you. Okay. Um, anyone else before we go back to repeats? Okay, Mayor Bajowski. I, I wanted to ask what, um, I seem to ask you this every couple of months as you were removing some of the Alt-19 um, corridor study things and adding key projects. So we had this corridor study, I think it was back in 2017 or 18, um, from Alt-19 from South County to North County all the way to the Pasco line. What is the end result of it? And where is the list of projects and why are we just dribbling it? Well, um, I mean, I think what we're working with the department on is to prioritize specific projects coming out of that. What, what the department had identified was placeholder money for preliminary engineering and survey uh, for the entire corridor. And we just didn't think that made a whole lot of sense because it just spread everything too thin and we want to see projects pushed out of this. So um, the main thing we want to do is make sure that there's support at the local government level from the recommendations that came out of the quarter study. But we don't even have that yet, do we? Quarter study has been complete and I believe it's on the department's website. I guess what I'm saying though is their study is complete, but the recommendations to everybody of what all the projects should be, where is that? Because, I mean, we think about the residents that came out to the charrettes and mm -hmm. gave all their input. We're in 2021. Granted, forget the year of COVID, but still it's three years. Well, we have sat down with the local government staff in Dunedin and the city of Clearwater, I believe Tarpon Springs, and we've gone through the recommendations with them. And we've asked them to identify what they support and what they don't support. And that was the first conversation um, that we've had. And I guess that was maybe three or four months ago that we had those conversations uh, with detail. And uh, at least in the Dunedin area, we got some pretty clear indications of what they would like to identify. Clearwater gave us some feedback on the improvements at Myrtle, for instance, along that corridor. And we're gonna be working with the department to continue to prioritize specific intersection improvements each year. Okay, so, 
and I guess I can talk offline with you, but I mean, and, and while I have no problem with us doing the causeway thing, you know I'm highly supportive of it, I can only speak to my own city, but I'm sure every other city along that road, elected officials understand that there's probably two or three priority projects. And I just feel like this process of a corridor study has been very different than any of the other ones, where we would have a very clear line as to, okay, if your city had three projects that needed to be completed, you would see some kind of schedule that you'd be able to communicate to our residents. And I, we don't have that. And that's very concerning to me. I feel like FDOT just sort of shoved this whole thing in a box. And that's not to condemn them in any way. But like we have no idea. And I'm not just speaking for Dunedin. I'm speaking for all the cities along Alt-19. They have projects. And I don't think anybody knows when any of them might be considered to be complete. So usually we don't wait from year to year to, okay, we got that project done, now maybe we can do this one. You usually sort of have a, a guideline, like we're getting ready to do the study on 580, State Road 580. Is this gonna be the same thing where it'll go on for 20 years not knowing when any of the things will be done? Well, it was 2018 when it was finished and it was a 30 mile corridor Yes, I know it's big, you know, I understand so, that. Um, and we do have Justin Hall, I believe, in the room. If Justin, if you want to come up and address the department's perspective on the Alt-19 corridor, that might be helpful. <clears throat> I'm not trying to beat you up, Justin. No, oh, you're promise. okay. That's a good question. Uh, Justin Hall, Florida Department of Transportation, District 7. Uh, so what we did, and, and Witt summarized it pretty well, so when the study was complete, we programmed the next step, which would have been design and some initial design work and some survey work for the entire corridor. And there was no path for us to fund additional design or construction because the overall estimate for the entire corridor was a very large number. Uh, I don't remember the total amount, but I mean, to the tune of, I think it's like $90 million to do all of the improvements that were recommended in the study. So we uh, sat down with WIT and sat down with, I think with your city actually, some of your, uh, some yeah. of your staff to discuss what were the number one improvements? What were the number two improvements, number three improvements? And let's come up with a project we can actually get in the ground in a hurry. And so the fastest way that the DOT we can move is to do a low bid design build project, which is the procurement method that we've utilized. So we can actually go design and construction within a couple of years. And so the first intersection that we programmed was the Alt-19 Curlew in fiscal year 23. And right now we're working with uh, witness team to define either the next intersection that we should do or the safety improvements that we should do, you know, packaged into a large project. And really this is just, I guess a different approach the DOT is taking to a lot of these corridors because it's such a big project that if we left it as a, a, <coughs> as a large corridor project, it would take a long time to get funded uh, because just to, looking at that large of a dollar amount just takes a while. So by breaking it up, we'll actually be able to put things on the ground quicker. Uh, so the all 19 Curlew intersection originally would have had a probably timeline of 2030 or 2029 on the old schedule. You know, now you're going into construction in 23. So, um, and that would be the same thing with the future corridors. They'll, they'll be constructed a lot quicker, the intersection, sorry. This corridor is also adjacent to the PSTA planned intermodal center in downtown Clearwater at Park Street. And so Myrtle goes right adjacent to this and their recommendation specifically for Myrtle. So if we can package that <laughs> into um, the improvements for the downtown intermodal center to improve safety and accessibility as people walk there, then you know we'll do that too. And so we're looking for opportunities to, to fund everything. And one other thing we looked at too is to package up several of the safety and operational improvements between the intersections. So there's uh, crosswalks and other enhancements that can occur you know, between intersections that could be easy to fund as well in a package. So, and that would kind of go along too with the Safe Streets Pinellas and some of the other initiatives of the MPO. Okay, so I guess what I'll say to you then, Wit, is as you know, we don't know what any of this is, but we do have infrastructure money that we know is available today and then possibly available in the future. It's like we did this long study and we have identified safety needs. Mm -hmm. And so I don't want us to do studies and then not do anything or take 20 years to do it. Right. Um, That's our goal. So I, I, I'm hoping that these things that are not on our list um, will be considered 
and at this point, it's we always use our list. So I'm I'm concerned about you removing a placeholder about Alt 19 in general. Well, if we left that placeholder in there, you're not getting Curlew funded in 23. That's well, well, that's what we had to do. We shifted that money over to Curlew and put it programmed it for. A and I'm even saying project. unfunded. I mean unfunded. It could be unfunded, but because we have funded and unfunded. You know what I'm saying? Right. Well, we will revisit the priority list every year. So we'll be back here this time next year to add another future project for Alt-19. Okay. I mean, I, I hear your comment, but I, I don't really don't know what else I can do. On well, I, I guess, I mean, what, couldn't we put on the unfunded list just a, a note, Alt-19 quarter study improvements? Because... I mean, we're all not going to be here for the next 20 years. Well, now, how do we remember that's out there and we did this and people put their their input into this residence? You see what I'm saying? I mean, we can't at least have an asterisk on the bottom of our priority list that says Alt-19 quarter study? We can. We could also add the State Road 60 quarter study we did in 2016. We Absolutely. could add, you know, I mean, we do a lot of quarter studies so that we're ready and know when it, when opportunity comes forward, what we can fund. And we go back to those studies and we look and see what's ready. But we'll put our heads together with Justin and Chelsea and we'll see what we can do to try to address your concern of packaging those up <coughs> and kind of having a little bit of a cue. But that's, I mean, I think that's what we were on a path to meet with the local governments and do because frankly, when we looked at the improvements in Clearwater, for instance, we weren't sure if all the city of Clearwater staff supported the recommendation. So we had to at least understand that. Mm -hmm. Same with Dunedin. I know you didn't love the jug handle roundabouts in downtown. That came out of that Hell study. No. <laughs> so, I mean, there were some things in the quarter study that need to be vetted through a design process. And maybe okay. it's a separate list. So I won't carry this on. But maybe, maybe it's a separate list. Respectfully, I don't know we have guests in the room today. So um, I'm going to go to uh, Commissioner Long, and then I'd like to have our patient guest um, uh, come up in just a second. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I really appreciate your recognizing me at the moment because I want to speak to the point that Mayor Bojowski is making. This all lends itself very beautifully. Wits heard me talk about this before. My constant, constant, constant plea, can we all please get on the same page and start having the conversation about how we fund transportation needs? If you just take a step back and listen from a hundred point view, this conversation that's been going on back and forth and back and forth for the last, I don't know, seven, eight, nine minutes, Think about that. We're talking about 2030. It's 2021. I mean, who knows in 2030 what the needs are going to be then? The way we projected the needs of today were a hell of a lot different 10, 15 years ago than they turned out to be. I think we could all agree. So I caution us when we start talking about these 10 and 20 year plans, how realistic that is in the great big scheme of things. Because I'm here to tell, tell you the way transportation, public transportation and all of that is changing quickly on a dime because of technology. We don't even know what it's going to be like 10 years from now. I just think that's a point that we need to be hammering over and over and over again to those people who can help, help re-envision how we fund this stuff. We've been doing the same thing for 50 years. The world is moving a lot faster today. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you. Our, our transit, transit and transportation successes are never by accident. Um, Commissioner Seal. I will be very brief. Um, I agree with both Mayor Bajowski and I agree with Commissioner Long. So I think where we go with this is what's already perhaps been suggested is that we have maybe a separate category of corridor studies and maybe it's attached to this list it's because we don't want to forget about it. I mean, from an elected official standpoint, 
somehow they do tend to disappear and then they never appear again. So I think this is a good way to proceed yeah. and that way we pay attention to it. Yeah. And then we also adjust if we need to. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much for your questions and comments, everyone. Um, Mayor Serrano, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being Chairman here today. Chairman Rice, would you mind if I went and oh, joined? Oh, please. Please do. Yes. Good okay. afternoon, everyone. And thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, to uh, make our request to directly to the board. Uh, before I do that, there's a couple of comments I'd like to make. And uh, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciated working with Whit Blanton. And I noticed Richard Moss in the background there. Uh, they have worked with us hand in glove to get us through this process and navigate us and get us to this point where we're actually on the priority list. So we thank you for that. Uh, this uh, proposal today, or, or objective today, is a joint recommendation from the lady next door to me, Mayor Kennedy. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to introduce some of the folks from Indian Shores. And I, I have to tell you, we very rarely agree on everything. <laughs> as a board. But I'll tell you, this is where we have unanimous agreement. So anyway, let me start with uh, Vice Mayor Hackerson, Councilor Petrocelli, uh, Councilor Shear, Councilor Bill Smith. Now, I'm going to ask Bill to come up here and speak. Some of you know Bill Smith. He's a 20-year dedicated public servant. He was here in the early 2000s when this whole project, sidewalk project for Indian Shores, snafued. So he can give you the boots on the ground, eyeball to eyeball on the project. I know Karen Seal, Commissioner Seal, was also here, so you can, you'll get both, pers both perspectives. I also have with us our, our town administrator, Bob um, Pinal, and our captain, uh, Glenn Smith. Our, our chief could not make it. Mayor, <coughs> Mayor, we need you to speak at the microphone, or oh, else we won't capture it. I, I, I usually don't need a microphone, but uh, <laughs> I'll okay. stand next to him. So yeah, he she'll keep me. Anyway. She'll keep me in line. That's the only reason she's up here. Okay. Anyway, uh, our objective, as it's on the board there, uh, the city of Indian Rocks Beach and the town of Indian Shores are requesting that the Forward Pinellas Board recommend a higher priority than now exists on the Forward Pinellas Multimodal Transportation Project Priority List. It's a mouthful. We're talking about sidewalks. Uh, why? Long overdue. As I'm going to try to show you today in this presentation, and it will be a brief one, uh, that this project should have been consummated many years ago. Uh, and I hope when you, when you see the data and the evidence, if you will, uh, you'll understand why we're going to, why are we requesting uh, this higher priority? Okay, if you could switch to the, okay. Many of you have seen this. It's basically a history of the project. And we have some FDOT representatives here so they can vouch for it. 1997, FDOT approached the city of Indian Rocks Beach and the town of Indian Shores and indicated to them that Gulf Boulevard would be a level F road by 2005. At that point, they recommended raised sidewalks and drainage. I would guess that Indian Rocks Beach agreed with it. I can tell you Indian Shores did. And as a result, a lot of planning went into it. Uh, bids went out, engineering drawings, uh, bids came back, the project got canceled. Money, monetary problems, perhaps the, uh, the Great Recession in 2008. So now we're in a situation where we need to rethink everything that's happened, I guess, in the last 20 years. One of the things that I would add to this list, which is there, is that FDOT has agreed to do a PD&E study in June of this year. That's the uh, precursor of a project. We, I believe, and Richard could talk better to it, where you look at the project design, you look at all the issues, you look at it from a different, uh, different perspectives, and you come up with some consensus of how the project should go forward. That really should dovetail with the actual project itself, because if the data is five or six years old from a PD&E perspective, 
it kind of doesn't make sense, or it could possibly not make sense. So since 1997, <clears throat> more residents, more tourists, and a hell of a lot more traffic. Uh, this is not a rural road. It's a major thoroughfare that connects the North Beaches and the South Beaches. It runs right through our towns, our respective towns. Do I do it? It's not me, it's Sarah. Just next slide. Next slide, Sarah. <laughs> okay. This is a document from the old MPO. It's dated, uh, excuse me, May 14th. 2003. Okay, I'll call your attention to paragraph Roman numeral 11. Gulf Boulevard improvement between Walsingham Road and Park Boulevard. The MPO discussed the fact that the Gulf Boulevard improvement project between Walsingham Road and Park Boulevard was on the priority list, but not funded. Was underway for this segment, and there were other projects such as future re future resurfacing and reclaim water project segment uh, that could be related to the improvement with a financial benefit through coordination. Now, somewhere along the line, we fell off the priority list. Now, when I've talked to Witt about this, he is not aware of a priority list back then, but here's a document that clearly states that uh, both the Indian Rocks and the Indian Shores project was on a priority list back in 2003. That's 18 years ago. Next slide, please. Okay. Whoops, we're out of sync. Go to the next one, because, and we'll come back to this one. Okay. This is your multimodal priority list. And you can see that uh, our sidewalk project uh, is, is uh, number 25. Okay, all of these projects are important. Obviously, they wouldn't be on the priority list if they weren't important. However, let me say this to you. The projects one through 24, if they were on a priority list in 2003, they would have been completed by 2015. As I understand, it's an eight to 12 year project cycle for the priority list. So all of these projects that are ahead of us right now, in terms of the priority, uh, would have been completed if they were prior, uh, on the priority list back in 2003. Now, as I said before, FDOT has agreed to do a PD&E study, and it's June 21, still? Yeah. And <laughs> that study dovetails with a project because it, it provides a lot of information and a lot of input to the engineers that are going to design that, design that particular project. So while we're going to take, uh, take approximately a year, Richard, I'm not sure. OK, so after a year, we're going to have all of this data, and we're going to be ready to go. And where are we? That's why one of the reasons we're asking to raise us up on the priority list. OK, can you go back to that? Oh, Sarah, I'm sorry. Go back to that. Uh, there we go. Some of you have seen this ad nauseum, but I think it bears repeating. This is a picture, a typical picture, of somebody walking down Gulf Boulevard in Indian Shores. Now, a lot of the water you see there is going to be eliminated under the existing maintenance project, so we're not going to have ponding. That's a good thing. But we still have droves, literally, of people walking on the side of a major thoroughfare. Now, I, I just want to say something sure. on there. And let me say that this picture doesn't do it justice because I don't know if we remember, and I think, Cliff, you were on the board then. Uh, I remember Ken Welch was, and he commented that the picture that we showed back when Mayor Serrano came before, there were probably eight pit people in the picture walking down the street. It was not season, and there was water all over the ground. And so... One of the main points about this whole presentation and Mayor Pat's passion for this is the safety issue. I mean, this is an accident waiting to happen. And, and I think that's the bottom line. And one of the things that I know all of us on this board agree about is our concept of Vision Zero, 
safety and keeping our tourists as well as everyone who lives in the communities from getting hit um, by a car or if you were riding your bike. So I, I think that, I'm sorry you don't have the slide where there, there's you know, eight to 10 people that are walking and it wasn't even season because that's the visual that I think everybody needs to see and why this project needs to move up. I thought the baby carriage would do better. Well, <laughs> it's not and, bad. Anyway, so we all agree that during the day, this is a real problem. Now think about it at night. Think about it in the evening, a little bit misty, a little bit humid, a car is coming down Gulf Boulevard, decides to make a left turn into a condo or what have you. The car behind it says, hmm, there's plenty of roadway on the right. Now we have an ordinance against that, but our police can only be in, in uh, any place at any time. And they go around that person, which, you know, makes sense. You know, it looks like there's asphalt to the right where I can go around. And there's a pedestrian, God forbid, and it's over. That's where the biggest issue is, is at night. This is an extremely dangerous situation. I'm sorry it hasn't been taken care of prior to this, and then we have to come here and plead with you folks, because that's what we're doing, to get this fixed. It, it's an accident waiting to happen. What I'd like you to do is hear from, because I, have, I wasn't around in 2003 or early 2000, Bill Smith, I have to tell you, Bill is one of those dedicated public servants, 20 years, I'm sorry, Just okay. 20 years, and uh, he also served, uh, for the big, served on the Big C uh, as a uh, director of the FSBPA. So he's been around. Some of you know him. And I just thought you, to hear some of his reflections would be helpful. Bill? Thank you, Matt. Hi, I am Bill Smith, a member of the Indian Shores Town Council. It's very nice to be here, here talking, talking to you. Thank you for the opportunity. I've been a member of the town council since I was appointed in August of 2001. So I've been on council since Gulf Boulevard and Indian Shores was just a two lane road with no accommodations for pedestrians, no sidewalks, no walkways, no bike paths, just vehicles. I can still remember seeing a young mother, probably a tourist, pushing a baby carriage down the Gulf Boulevard traffic lane, because that was the only place that she could go. In about 2004, a multi-purpose project was being developed, a Gulf Boulevard rebuilding project that would include a town project to underground utilities, a county project to install reclaim water lines, and a DOT project to rebuild Gulf Boulevard with sidewalks, drop curbs, and a full drainage system that included 219 inlets along the road for taking in water. The project began with undergrounding utilities. While that was going on, DOT was redesigning their project. In this redesign, curbs and sidewalks were replaced with bike and pedestrian lanes flush with the roadway, built with pervious pavement for drainage replacing all but 10 of those 219 inlets. The design change was revealed in a meeting in July of 2007. Until then, we assumed the original design with curb and sidewalks would be built. That's how we lost our sidewalks, was in that redesign. And that's why we're asking for your help to get, get them back. Thank you very much. Sarah, would you go to the last slide, please? Okay. Uh, this is a document that I think you're all familiar with. It just recently came out under Whit Blanton's signature. Uh, it's the uh, Safe Street Pinellas Action Plan uh, uh, appro uh, approved the goal of zero deaths and serious injuries on our roadways in 2045. We couldn't agree more, but we think based on the, uh, the information I've given you today, that you will strongly reconsider our position on the priority list for, what, for, for all of the, uh, all of the intervening years. And it's, it's time uh, to do something here. Uh, th this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
is a clear and present danger. It's so obvious, it's staring us right in the face. Thank you for your consideration. Okay, here we go. History in the past, history in the making. Um, what wasn't mentioned was that originally Golf Boulevard was planned to be four lane. And so that was the path in which we originally were embarking, and it was way too expensive. And so this unfortunately became the compromise. And I remember at the time saying, why don't we just put a bike lane and a sidewalk on one side of the road instead of both? And it was, oh, that's an ADA issue. That's, you know, Brian Smith said, you know, we can't do that. We have to put it on both sides. And then it was still going to be way too expensive. And then, I mean, with all due respect, Indian Shores decided that they wanted to underground. So then this became another whole morphine project as it went along. And they added the impervious asphalt, which at the time we all were concerned about. We were concerned about the, whether it's going to, with all the sand, if it's going to block up and flood. And so, yes, it does. And yet, you know, so we do need to address this. I think that we'll have a lot better information after the PD&E study is done with the options clearly laid out. But at that point, when we know what the options are, I think that's when we address it and we prioritize it. This does need to be fixed. And, you know, we, but on the other hand, throughout Pinellas County, and this is again going back in history, something I was always fearful about is be careful what you wish for. So if we put curb and sidewalk here, many of our bike trails throughout Pinellas County are at grade and not separated. They all have the potential for people to come over here on the right side and do the bypass. So I don't know how we really address that, but I only bring that up because Golf Boulevard is designed like many of our other streets are designed to um, for sidewalks. So as DOT does the PD&E study, I would ask that maybe we look relook again at putting one side only curb and sidewalk and making it wider so that it would be safer and and or if there's something else that can be looked at that <coughs> would solve the problem because the other part of this is I remember in history again saying build it and they will come this is used a lot once this was built for pedestrians and bicyclists you any day of the week you see people using it probably, I would venture, even more than the Pinellas Trail, so especially during the season. So I support that we need, once we get the results back from the PD&E, we need to move forward as rapidly as we can. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Bajowski. On the unfunded list, what, I know you've got them numbered, but does that mean that's the priority order? Or is that just to show you how many items you have on the list? <laughs> it, it's meant to be in priority order. It is. Yeah, uh, and we, you know, we don't have a hard and fast rule. We try to keep it to about 30 projects. Um, and I, I just want to point out that, uh, you know, Commissioner Long made a really good point we don't have unlimited resources. So we're having to deal with the revenue streams that we um, we have for transportation projects. And to Mayor Serrano's point, uh, a lot of the projects that are on our priority list, some of them dealing with US-19 and other projects have been on that priority list since the 1990s. Um, it just takes a long time to assemble $100 million, $100 million, and $100 million. The Gateway Expressway, 250 or maybe $500 million for that one. So, um, you know, what we've tried to do in the last several years is break projects down into smaller pieces that we can get funded and get funded more quickly rather than major projects. Up until 2015, we only prioritized highway projects. So that's why I had the point about, I'm not sure we ever had this on anything other than a transportation alternatives list 
because we didn't have a multimodal priority list. Um, it might have been the four laning, for instance, that might have been on a priority list. Um, so that's, you know, back to the Curly Road is we're breaking these into small projects that we can get funded. And unfortunately, this is just still a big price tag pro uh, project. But I'm totally supportive of what the mayor said. I think it's a clear and present danger as he identified. Um, so let's see what the pd &E study yields. And then we would certainly recommend at a staff level that we do everything we can to get something funded if it's supported by the town and if it's something that we can do. Um, and I don't know if the department wants to speak to this issue, but um, I think you, you probably deserve that opportunity. Development District 7. Um, like the mayor said, we have been working on this project, the current project out there for about five years. Um, there is some issues out there. Uh, we do just want to clarify one thing. It is a, a, a feasibility and pd and &E study. We're going to be going out to the community and getting input. There's a lot of things there. We have very limited amount of right of way. There's 40 feet from 195th up through Indian Rock. So it's fairly tight. So we're going to get that and get some estimates on that. Um, it's not your typical standard FDOT typical section out there. And we do realize that there is a safety issue out there as well and, and totally support what we're doing with this. And we'll move forward with it, with, especially with input from the community, because there are, there are a lot of encroachments into the FDOT right of way out there. And you know, it's a, very, it's a beach community and you know, it, it's just got a different feel to it and a different purpose to it. And we're gonna work through that with the mayor and, and that. So just wanted to provide that clarification. We're getting started in July. It'll probably take us about a year, um, and then we'll, we'll we'll move forward and work with Wit and everybody on uh, involved with that on trying to get the next phase funded, which would more than likely have some type of right away phase. Um, so it, it, you talk about you know potentially chopping it up, you know from 195th South. We do have enough right away to do something, but there's so many encroachments and so many um, uh, interested parties. That, are, that have um, built improvements on the right of way so that we've got to coordinate that. And then from 195th up to um, uh, Indian Rocks, we were gonna to have to look at that and see exactly what we wanna do with that. Because there are, you know, the, the, um, um, over the years, the uh, bus, you know, there's a, 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 a bus route through there that, that they use the shoulder. So that shoulder, that flush shoulder is being used. So there's a lot of users so we're gonna to have to coordinate that through the whole process and work with the community to make sure that we're, we don't, that they understand the impacts of putting in sidewalks and, and raised median. So it, it could, it, this project can be very intrusive or it, you know, or it could not be. And that's what FDOT is gonna work with the communities on. Quick question. Um, Commissioner Seal mentioned the idea, and I think it's a good one. To, will you all consider in that one that area that's pretty tight just doing it on the one side? Will that be, um, you know, the... Yeah, we, I mean, what, what, what will ever make sense, Commissioner? Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have several typicals on that. Um, I, it could, that could be a good idea because there are a lot of uh, cyclists. There's actually two types of cyclists out there. There's the ones that are really serious and they get in the lane and they do that, and then there's the ones that are on the sidewalk. So. You know, we've batted around, you know, 10 foot sidewalk, two 10 foot sidewalks and two 10 foot lanes, but then we're right at the right of way line. Um, we're gonna just have to work with the community on that, you know, and, and try and get it as safe as possible. They're, they walk on both sides of the road too, because there's development on both sides of the road. So, you know, if we do some lighted uh, or signalized crossings, maybe, you know, some of the- Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes, Commissioner Mertz. You need to put your microphone. Thank you. Um, being new on the board, I'm not sure if there's with a history on this, but um, this definitely seems like a Gulf Boulevard wide resiliency sustainability issue of issues with, with water coming on mm. from, from things like that. Is this a, um, it, it, it is the study that you're dealing with part of a bigger entire study or is it just a small piece? I'm just wondering if, if it's piecemealed, yeah. you know, will one thing have an impact on, you know, a future study to the south of it or to the north of it? The road between essentially Park to the south and Walsingham to the north, it doesn't have the, the sidewalk for the most part. 
So that's what we're focusing in on, on either side of that. I believe Treasure Island has sidewalks to the south and to the north, I believe they have sidewalks as well. Okay. So it's just that one, one um, section. A lot of, some of the issues is maintenance, you know, um, I, I believe Commissioner Steele mentioned about the, the sand and then the, then, then the, uh, the uh, pedestrian pass with painted red, that caused some issues with clogging. So we're trying to get this thing fixed correctly. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Mers, to your point, this is one of the corridors we identified in our resilient Tampa Bay transportation project. Um, we identified a couple of priority corridors and this is one of those. So we are looking at ways that we can harden and, and make it more adaptive and sustainable over time. And we may now have that opportunity with federal funding. So um, I'm glad we've gone through that effort and we've named this corridor as one of those. That sounds like it's a good starting point for sure. Yeah, definitely one that's got track record that would be a reason to. I just want to be pursue. real cautious of complicating further what the department is trying to do for this one section. Um, but but that is something we'll be working with the department on eventually. Okay. So, so what you mean, in other words, there's some more short-term things we can do to address immediate safety hazards, but a long-term plan to address coastal flooding, which it's just a matter of when that happens. Yeah. Is the flooding that we saw the pictures of, was that rainy day flooding or, that, or that sunny was, day flooding? That tends to be a summer shower. Yeah. Okay. The, the, those type of events we get, they get uh, it doesn't take much. Okay, got it. And just for the board's information, we, our current project out there is scheduled to be done about mid-August this year, mm -hmm. depending, weather depending. So that, those flooding issues that you saw in that picture have been designed to be um, alleviated. Um, but we, we still have the issue of the um, at-grade um, sidewalk and um, bike lane with the road. So hopefully we'll be able to get the pedestrians out of the road, get the, get the water drained off. Well, Thank you. Thank you for hearing our concerns. I think you hear that we all really share this and you heard from our colleagues from Indian Shores how serious this is. So thank you for, for hearing us out as you um, as we embarked on the pd &E study. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next item is 5E. This is an action item. So. After we hear from WIT, um, we'll listen to members of the public and we will have our discussion and vote. All right. Thank you for that conversation on the multimodal priorities. Um, I want to shift gears to a policy direction uh, for the agency uh, at our workshop back in January, which I thought was very productive. Uh, we had a good discussion about uh, priorities of the incoming board uh, for this year and, um, and goals that you wanted to see accomplished. Clearly getting projects built faster uh, is one. Um, but from our perspective, uh, we really wanted to look at updating our spotlight emphasis areas that we adopted in 2015 with your direction. And uh, you know, we have the alt uh, the US 19 vision, uh, we have the beach access, uh, which I think this Gulf Boulevard discussion falls under. And then we had the gateway master plan as the third emphasis area. And I'm uh, just really happy that uh, I think we've put the uh, gateway master plan uh, essentially to bed with uh, an ongoing uh, commitment to implement the plan with our local partners. So that's kind of bumping along. I think we have a lot in play on the enhancing beach community access with the T-Barta aerial gondola study, uh, with uh, this PD&E on uh, Gulf Boulevard and St. Pete Beach recently came to us with some interest in, in doing some work down there. Uh, and for US-19, we've got a workshop coming up and we have asked DOT to advance the frontage road safety study, which they've done. So a lot of things are in motion. What we're recommending to you today is that you endorse uh, a new spotlight emphasis area called Innovations for Target Employment and Jobs Access. And this would address sort of the twin pressures we're seeing from a land development perspective on the need to provide more housing that's affordable in our county and meet the, de the growing demand and also to ensure that we are preserving our employment base so that those new residents to Pinellas County have jobs that they can go to. And this recognizes that, uh, you know, as a, as a small, compact, densely developed county, we have to be creative in how we use our industrial and employment space. 
and maximize that space uh, for its most productive uses. Our long range plan adopted a strategy around investment corridors, which are focused on redevelopment, housing affordability, and connecting people from where they lived to where they work or where they get job training and, and other skills. And I think this plays into that as well. And then the legislature in 2020 passed uh, House Bill 1339, which uh, removes our ability to regulate uh, affordable housing uh, in the proper areas by opening up any affordable housing project to industrial or employment or commercial areas, uh, notwithstanding any local laws or regulations to the contrary. So that preemption uh, has kind of forced us to really think about a process uh, for how we look at um, projects that may be affordable housing in areas where we also have the policy of protecting and preserving for employment use. So uh, what we propose to do is update the target employment and industrial land study from 2008. Uh, that would give us um, better ability to differentiate um, really strong um, employment lands from those that might be more marginal and maybe suitable for potentially other uses or to enable mixed use development and some level of on-site housing, for instance, which uh, proximity for housing and work is a good thing. Uh, it would allow us to establish a design studio program in partnership with Pinellas County to help people visualize um, how we can reinvent and, and innovate in our industrial and employment areas. Um, and it would also focus on ensuring that we've got better regional multimodal access to job locations in Pinellas County. And I think I've recounted to you at least one or two instances of local employers who've told me that um, you know they've moved to the mid county for more space but now they can't recruit white collar workers because of the length of time and congestion and travel that it takes to get people from wherever they live um, so we are a connected region and for all those reasons we're recommending this be the new spotlight that we'll focus on over the next two years uh, and it will not we're not sunsetting the other ones uh, we're kind of just maybe moving them a little bit into the background, or at least the gateway one a little bit into the background as this moves more into the forefront. And um, we are, this is an action item um, for any board direction or support for this. And I look forward to your questions or comments. Thank you, Whit. So we'll go to board discussion. Questions, comments? Commissioner Mers. Uh, turn on your microphone, please. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, you know, reading through this, I, I think it addresses comments that were made at the workshop, and I think, um, um, I, I think the updating the target employment industrial land study um, makes sense. I think the only concern I would have is just in perhaps the criteria that's used for the evaluation. And I think that would be, um, earlier today we talked a little bit about the uh, TOD and conduct connectivity is the key. And my, I guess my concern is, is, is that there would need to be, you know, industrial lands need to be evaluated based on things other than just connectivity to a bus route, let's say. Okay. so. I, I could see a concern that if, if that's the primary connection, that perhaps a whole bunch of pieces of property would end up being rated low. Low ratings then could be used as a criteria for, you know, changing the zoning. Okay. So, whereas I think that's important in some places, I don't think that's the only criteria because obviously many businesses are operating successfully without being connected directly to a bus line or a rail line or something like that. So, um, but the fact that it's being done in partnership with the uh, Pinellas County Economic Development, I think that's a very good and a good way to connect those two in. So, um, you know, there, there's no specific criteria listed at this point, but um, I, I think the initial reading in light of the discussions we had earlier today, to me that was something that I felt that was important to express that uh, um, you know, the industrial lands need to be reviewed from an industrial lands perspective in addition to other things. So, 
if I may, I think your point's really well taken. Um, I completely agree. This focus will revisit all criteria. So uh, we're not set, um, it, we, you know, as we go into this uh, on what we're going to assume is rating industrial land and employment land better than others. We're going we're gonna to revisit all that. Um, what I would say, though, is if you're planning to put affordable housing in an industrial area, you probably need to have transit access. That would be my thinking anyway. But if it's not planned for affordable housing and it's just a job center, um, it'd be nice to have transit, but I don't know if that's the only criteria. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, you know, we're going to try and be nuanced about that. Exactly. Thank you. I also want to mention, if I can, yes, uh, Monday we met with County Administrator Burton and went over our budget, uh, and this is kind of baked into our budget that you'll see in a few minutes. And uh, he was very excited about this um, update of the target employment industrial land study and singled that out in conversation because, as you know, we have some changes with Pinellas County economic development happening. Um, their director is retiring. And um, uh, Barry mentioned that he wants to kind of look at um, a fresh approach to how we do economic development in Pinellas County. And he was really eager to see this be a piece of that. So the timing is, is good from his perspective, and, and he did reinforce that. Yeah. Well, thank you. I, I want to thank you, Whit, for the, the time and the thought you've put into helping to lead these discussions and this proposal. Um, I'm strongly in support of it. I think um, there's nothing more foundational to our economic development than transportation and transit. And I think the focus on target employment and jobs access is a real important way for us to keep our focus on um, extremely important issues. And, um, and I don't want it to get lost in a bullet point, but um, I think it's also important that we weave um, equity and safety as, an, as a value, as a, yeah, as a value into everything we look at. I know that at one point in time we talked about maybe looking at those separately, but I much prefer the focus on target employment and jobs access, and then looking at how we use an equity lens and a safety lens at looking at all of our projects. And I know that will probably be a new mindset and a new skill set, set to develop, maybe not so much on safety, but how, learning how to really understand and, and to talk about equity and why it's important is, is really key. And I know we're doing an equity study now, and I think part of that study will be a really important part, a really important piece that will help forward Pinellas start to really adopt that into our way of thinking. So, um, Sarah, uh, let me make sure we don't have any m more board member comments or questions. I don't see any hands. Okay, Sarah, do we have anyone in Zoom or in the room who wish to speak on the spotlight emphasis area? We have no one in the room. Anyone in Zoom who wishes to speak on this item, please use the raise hand button and Zoom at this time, or press star nine on the phone if you're calling in. We have no one wishing to speak on this item. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So do I hear a motion and a second to approve the new spotlight emphasis area? Motion to approve. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great, that passes unanimously. Our next item is 5F. It's the fiscal year 22 Pinellas Planning Council budget discussion. Uh, this presentation will be led by Rodney Chapman. Hi, Rodney. Uh, good afternoon, board. Um, we are here uh, today again today to talk more about money. Um, what uh, we'll spend the few uh, next few minutes talking about is uh, the budget outline for fiscal year 22 for the Pinellas Planning Council. Because of the impacts from the coronavirus and the lengthy shutdown of the national economy, we think it's important to provide a few national as well as local economic data points to frame today's conversation. Uh, the national unemployment rate in March was 
However, in Florida, that rate was 4.7%. And the latest available data for Pinellas County shows the rate at 4.0%. And we think this is very good news. And also, since the Planning Council's operations are funded by property taxes, we thought it important to also share data on home sales. Uh, the median price of homes in Florida is up uh, about 8%, and in Pinellas County, it's up a little over 10%. Uh, likewise, the number of homes that were sold in Florida is up almost 6%, and overall, taxable values were up 7.3% uh, uh, during the last fiscal year. In working with the Office of Management and Budget to prepare the draft budget outline, we had to use several assumptions to estimate revenues and expenditures. Uh, the main revenue assumption for fiscal year 22 is that countywide property taxes would grow only 1% and that salary and benefits costs would grow uh, by about 2.3%. As we discussed in great detail at the January board work session uh, that Witt had talked about previously, uh, we prepared the fiscal 22 uh, budget outline with a millage increase to 0 0.0160, which returns the rate to the level it was uh, back in fiscal year 16. Uh, with this increase in the millage, along with that 1% increase in projected property tax revenues, gives our agency an additional $101,000 in the next fiscal year. Salaries and benefits are projected to decrease due to retirements and a realignment of staff responsibilities and operating costs are expected to increase. Uh, you see that amount of increase here and I understand that the amount of the increase in operating expenses seems large however this increase allows our agency to take on uh, some of those initiatives that with just mentioned uh, in alignment with the new spotlight emphasis area focused on innovations and target employment and jobs access. Uh, this increase also allows us to offset reductions in matching funds for MPO grants that we covered back in January, uh, cover increases in intergovernmental service charges, as well as maintain about 20% of expenditures in reserves. These revenues fund the PPC operations, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, on the subsequent slides. But essentially, it allows for us to continue our ongoing assignments related to the administration of the countywide plan. Uh, those are those map amendments that you see uh, every month uh, that come to us uh, after local governments have taken action in their local conference or plans. We also uh, can continue to provide technical assistance to our local government partners, and again, this is something that we uh, take pride in and uh, often get requests. We just got a request earlier today to have a uh, continued conversation with the city of St. Pete Beach about some technical assistance they would like along the Gulf Boulevard corridor. Uh, we will also uh, continue our steps in implementing the Gateway Master Plan and work with cities to plan for redevelopment within the investment corridors. As I mentioned earlier, and Witt also uh, did a good job of describing um, these uh, key initiatives for fiscal year 22, we do plan to update the 2008 Target Employment Industrial Land Study to assess the current high wage job potential of the county, measure the success of the current policies, as well as identify new tools to keep Pinellas competitive with neighboring counties. We also plan to partner with Pinellas County's Housing and Community Development Department on a design studio pilot program to help communities visualize change and redevelopment opportunities. And lastly, uh, our planning partnership with PSTA continues to pay dividends. I was encouraged to hear the positive comments about our TOD work uh, with uh, PSTA, the city of St. Pete and South Pasadena thus far. Uh, last uh, funding cycle, we applied for an additional FTA TOD planning grant and were successful in getting that award. And so we plan to conduct a phase two uh, effort uh, in fiscal year 22 that will focus on building form, design, and visualization guidance for the development community. 
And just to give you a sense of um, how these applications were put together, uh, currently uh, we have about a little less than $60,000 of staff time as part of the local match for the current FTA TOD planning grant. This slide shows you um, a snapshot of the PPC millage rate and capacity uh, from the 2008-2009 timeframe up to uh, current year. Uh, the blue is uh, the adopted millage at that uh, during that particular year, and the green is that capacity. And again, I just want to remind the board that we can have continued for many years to operate the agency in a very fiscally conservative manner. And uh, even with this proposed millage increase, we're still only at about 10% of the cap. Hmm. That's good. Um, and lastly, just to talk about a few, a few next steps, as Whit mentioned, we met with the county administrator earlier this week and uh, had a very good discussion about uh, the direction of the agency. He was very complimentary of our work and uh, is encouraged by the plans that we, we have for fiscal year 22. Um, we will be having a um, presentation in front of the Board of County Commissioners on May 20th to talk, to, to talk further about our budget priorities for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, we have the option of coming back to the board again with additional budget discussion uh, at your June meeting. Uh, typically, we will then follow that up with a uh, action for the board to adopt the, the budget resolution and millage rate in July. Uh, we're considering um, altering these dates a bit depending on uh, some of the schedules of some of the board members. So these June and July uh, dates may change, but uh, the September 9th and September 21st dates are, are locked in. Those uh, dates are when the Board of County Commissioners will uh, adopt the fiscal year 22 millage rate and budgets. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. We're not taking action on this today. Um, any comments or questions? Okay, I, I have a question. So for Rodney or for Witt, so the operating expenses are projected to increase by about $543,000. And were there other expenses as well anticipated? What well, uh, Chair, within that $543,000 uh, number is a few things. It's those special or key initiatives that we talked about, yes. some funding for the, the TO, Target Employment Industrial Land Study, the Design Studio. We um, have funding in there to replace uh, the local match for the FTA 5305 program, uh, also for the Urban Design Studio pilot. Um, we will continue our fellowship uh, agreement with USF's Department of Urban and Regional Planning to have a uh, an intern with us for the, the that current academic year, and then it allows for us to um, to do things like convert to Granicus, uh, which has been a priority of some of our board members, as well as um, kind of replenish the reserve uh, fund uh, to meet or exceed uh, that board policy. Great, thank you. I guess where I'm going with this and what I still need to understand about those initiatives that, I mean, typically as a good uh, budget policy, recurring expenses should be addressed by recurring revenue. One-time expenses should be a one-time shot. So I'm just wondering if, if these are one-time expenses for these initiatives, would we also consider getting funding from the county to cover this rather than doing a millage rate adjustment, which would be an ongoing revenue source. Let me try and address that, Rodney, and jump mm -hmm. in if I say anything wrong. Um, <laughs> um, so, well, first of all, um, the county is partnering with us on the design studio. They're okay. putting in $25,000. Um, our focus is countywide, mm -hmm. and they're the unincorporated county, so I think mm -hmm. our share should be probably a little bit more and then secondly, it's the county had the 10% match for the 5305 funds and advised us a year ago they were taking that out of the budget. So oh, that's, that's right. happened. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, it's just not easy to go to the county and say, hey, partner with us on this. Mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, because 
those things have happened. Um, but, but in some cases, they are doing that. So you know, we are making those steps. But I also kind of want to connect you back to where we were in 2015. We were sitting on a million dollars, a million two, in unassigned fund balance revenues. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when we made the decision to roll back the millage rate beyond the rollback rate mm -hmm. and, um, and spend down that, that unassigned fund balance at the board's direction. So we've now spent that down. So we don't have the reserves and we can't sustain the operations we have. Mm -hmm. So this is really for ongoing, recurring operating costs. Uh, it's just we're, we're front-loading in that TEAL study update at $250,000. Okay, thank you. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Commissioner Mers. Yes, thank you. Um, during the workshop, there was a discussion about this and also a reference to OPUS and and some discussion as to evaluations would be considered whether there are alternatives to OPUS or we would still be continuing with OPUS because OPUS had some additional costs associated with it that would be reflected by this. What, what's the status with that, please? Um, I haven't heard anything lately, but I know that the county is uh, investigating an alternative um, software um, for human resources that would enable them to uh, have a more modern system. And we use Opus for a lot of things, uh, everything from timesheet entry to, um, you know, uh, disaster um, assignments and things like that. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for everything in the county. And it's very outdated. Um, so human resources, is their needs are driving this conversation, but we don't have a procurement yet or a piece of software or a known cost that's going to get worked through. Our next appointing authorities meeting is in May, so I imagine I'll have an update in May, and I can bring that back to you. But I guess my point back in January was I expect that there'll be more intergovernmental costs to pay for those kinds of software upgrades that are countywide and will need to be recouped somehow. And, but that's not yet baked into our cost assumptions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I don't, my, my computer's just going on the fritz right now, so I'm, I've lost the, uh, the presentation. Um, and I, I, I guess what I'm struggling with right now, so, I, I so respect the fact that we've been fiscally very careful over the years, um, and to, to the extent that we even lowered a millage rate um, when we didn't need the extra money. Um, so in an era where we're, we're really struggling to make you know, ends meet, we're looking at this coming year's budget right now. I mean, we're just starting our budget review process, and so we're going to get an overall sense of where we're going. I mean, it, the idea of a millage increase when we're still getting, and again, Rodney, maybe you could, uh, what was the revenue increases that we were looking at um, for, for, the, for the overall revenue increase estimate for our operation next year? Uh, a little over five hundred thousand dollars, operating. And 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 what's the per, what is that percentage uh, uh, equal to roughly? Um, well, we the previous fiscal year was uh, around a uh, hundred and let me get that number. One hundred and seventy-two thousand was the fiscal year twenty-one number. One hundred seventy-two thousand was what? Yeah. Was the fiscal year twenty-one the current fiscal year number for that? Um, Hold on, let me back up here. No, was, yeah, I, I'm just trying to make sure I understand what percent revenue increase we're getting so that, you know. Uh, well, the percent revenue increase based on the, the proposed millage, we'd be taking another $101,000 there in the second bullet. Well, I'm, I guess I'm not asking the question right. Um, I, what I'm concerned about is that we're getting a value increase based on, on, the, on, the, on, you know, we're getting increased revenues based on the increase in values. And so I was just trying to understand what that piece was and what the separate increase due to the millage rate. There's two components that are driving the increase in revenues, and I just want to make sure I'm clear what they are. And so we don't have to do that today. We can look at it next month. But to me, those are important pieces. Again, the fact that we've been fiscally very careful uh, makes me really seriously consider this, but it's just a really 
tough year to be looking at. We're already looking at tax increases, so we're talking about a millage increase also. So, I want to make sure. Commissioner, I'm I do have I do have that number for you. Yeah. Um, the one percent increase at the current millage rate, or sorry, the one percent um, property tax increase at the current millage of zero point zero one five zero is about one million three hundred thirty eight thousand. And then at the same 1% increase at the, the proposed millage of 0 0.0160 is 1,480,000. All right, well, I'll take a look at this for next month, but those are just the overall comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Bajowski. Sure. Um, wait, on our uh, agenda review call, we talked a little bit about the um, you know, kind of, and we also, I think, to uh, Cliff's comments earlier at our strategic planning session, we also talked about one of the major hurdles is is the jump over the last year or two of, and maybe it's more than that, of the um, uh, costs assigned from the county. Um, we have that in our city where we assign admin costs. We we've called it. Dave and I have beat that dead horse so many times because it changes, you know, depending on when the wind blows and what your needs are, you know, that admin cost that you charge the various, um, for us it's enterprise funds, okay, um, and that's kind of like what you are, operating like an enterprise fund. Um, and your your costs for that have gone up to 500000 right? Can you just speak a little bit to that? and? Sure. Where you think you are with that? Because I do think we did talk about it, and you were going to work on it. And I know you have, but I think it's really good for all of us to understand what that is. When I was hired in 2015, I think we were paying $89,000 uh, in intergovernmental charges, which cover things like um, uh, the business and technology services, which is our computer support, uh, our legal support, our human resources support, things like that, among others. Uh, real estate, all those kind of things. For some things, we're direct billed, like rent. For other things, they're packaged into the intergovernmental service charges. Uh, and it's been tough sometimes sorting out all those things. So I'm not sure we had a really accurate accounting when I was hired in 2015. Um, but Rodney and his team, uh, Rebecca and Joanne, have been working very closely with the county to to really get a better handle on that. And a lot of what's driving that is our use of geographic information systems, which is a big part of our work, the licenses and software that we use in our mapping. Um, and and we've, we've asked for more of that because every new planner coming out of graduate school has to be an expert in GIS now. So those costs have risen um, to a, a little over $400,000 now, and I expect that they will continue to increase. That's what we talked about with the OPA software change. Um, and that's just been the trend. Um, so what we're really looking at is kind of making sure that we're properly accounting for those expenses and that we have the revenue to cover them. And you know, if I could go back to 2015 um, and knowing exactly how this was going to play out, I don't think I, I, I didn't know what I didn't know, right? So I, I didn't know that we didn't have a full understanding of what all those intergovernmental service charges were and how they were going to rise over the next several years. And I probably wouldn't have rolled back the millage rate if I had known that. Um, I remember Jim Kennedy telling me at the time, our chairman, that, you know, let's roll back the millage rate because when we've merged the two agencies, we're going to save money. And I said, well, you know, and I told him, I said, we're probably not going to save money because if we do this right, we're going to expand, uh, you know, our, our, our value to local governments, to our partners, and we're going to be doing more. And I think that's what we've seen. And we're in more demand for our services than we've ever been. And I think we've changed the culture of the Pinellas Planning Council from an organization that kind of people did this to, to now it's like, come on in and help us. And we're much more of a collaborative partner. So we've stepped up our game. We've increased our services. At the same time, we haven't, you know, we cut back our revenues and then costs have risen. So we find ourselves in a little bit of a difficult spot we're not in crisis mode or anything, but I certainly don't want to be in a position of reducing our level of service to our local government partners. I think that would be the step backwards. Well, and I appreciate those comments. I certainly, the projects on your list that are, 
you know, adding some of the above the normal increases that you would have with every governmental budget. I certainly wouldn't want to see us reduce those things um, because we are building this organization to be different and better. And I'm, as I'll say, as I did at strategic planning, I'm especially supportive of this, the city support that this organization has given out versus 10, 20 years ago, if you will. Not that there wasn't any, I don't mean it that way. But, you know, for small cities like Dunedin um, or Indian Rocks Beach or any other little small city that doesn't have the widespread staff like a St. Pete or a Clearwater or a Largo, um, you know, having that connection when you have roads that go through your city that cause all kinds of drama, I mean, it, it, it's very, very helpful. So I want to thank you all for that. The only thing I would suggest, given, and again, I'll look at Commissioner Eggers, given our past history, I'm sure, I'm sure Dave has probably gone through the county uh, admin cost with a fine tooth comb, just knowing him the way I do. So I would highly suggest just, again, to continue on with that and, and you know, keep fighting the good fight. Obviously, we have to pay our weight. That's what we do, you know, as an enterprise fund, if you will. But just, just stay on that, and uh, thank you for, for all your work. Yes, Commissioner Albritton. Yeah, just, uh, just a question. Your uh, contingency here, you just have a number. Is that based on a percentage? Can you address that, Rodney? I think that is based on a percentage contingency. Yes, the the, contin the contingency and uh, the reserve amount are added to data together, and that is what we use to meet the board policy for reserves, which is a minimum of 10% of expenditures. All right, thank you. So, okay. 18, something like that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rodney. We will move on to our next item, which is 5G. This is not an action item, but it's an important update on the downtown St. Pete mobility study update from Sarah Caper. Hi, Sarah. Good afternoon. Thank you for allowing me the time to speak today on the downtown St. Pete mobility study. I'll try to go quickly. I know it's been a long meeting for you. The downtown St. Pete mobility study is a partnership. We're doing it uh, with the Florida Department of Transportation and the city of St. Petersburg. We also have study partners, um, including Pinellas County and PSTA who've been attending our advisory committee meetings and working with us. The purpose of the Downtown St. Pete Mobility Study is to define a vision for multimodal mobility in the greater area downtown, to test different improvement strategies against mobility, livability, and economic vitality performance measures, and then finally to identify projects and programs to advance. And you'll see here on the slide a traffic modeling area as well as our focused corridors and focused area in the downtown. We started with thinking about what our vision is and what we want our future to be and the goals that we have. And you can see here on the slide, some of them for you focused on safety, accessibility, multimodal, connected and vibrant. We then have been thinking about how we get there. What should we be measuring with our performance measures and our values? And then how do we evaluate the different projects? and then how we balance those different needs. We know there are trade-offs that will have to be made eventually, and so how do we balance those things like quick and easy vehicle access, safe bicycle and pedestrian conditions, and also connecting the community. On the slide here, you can see the four-part approach that we're taking as we look at different kinds of projects, one being bike, ped, and transit projects that could help improve mobility, Another, looking at opportunities to convert one-way pairs to two-way operations. 
We're spending a lot of effort looking at the spurs of the interstate system, I-375 and I-175, to see if we can make changes that would help mobility, especially with the communities just outside of the downtown area. And then finally, if there are other safety and mobility enhancements we should be looking at. As part of this study, we did community outreach and we did a survey last summer where we asked people about how they interact with downtown, how they travel there, why do they live there, where they're coming from. And so here are just a look at some of the results. The full results are online. Our website is forwardpinellas.org slash DTSP. We also, in the fall and winter of this year, held listening sessions with community partners, and they were also open to the public. You can see some images of those here as well, asking specific questions about especially the one-way pairs and the interstate spurs. We also had a website that's been online and open for an interactive forum where people can view the discussion and upvote or dislike different comments. As part of the study, we've been looking at existing conditions. Here's just a sample of some of what we looked at. Things like socioeconomic data of the median household income, looking at health indicators in the area to see who's in the area and how they travel and how we might be able to help them. Safety is an important consideration as part of this study. So for example, we looked at the crashes on one-way pairs compared to two-way streets. And you can see a lot more crashes when you look at how many one-way pairs there are compared to two-way are happening on the one-way pairs. Also looking at the pedestrian and bicycle crashes, especially the ones that are incapacitating or fatal. This is one example of what we did as part of our assessment. We looked at facilities, barriers, and opportunities. This is just the pedestrian one. We did similar ones for bicycling, for safety, for transit, where you could see some of the previous studies that have been done where they had recommendations and things we saw ourselves when we looked at where the sidewalk gaps are, where there are barriers from the existing roadways and other um, needs and opportunities in the area. We used a tool called street light data to also figure out how people are traveling. We know the surveys that we did last summer give us a look at people who filled out the survey, how they travel, but we thought it would be helpful to see um, pre-pandemic how people are traveling. So this data was done before the pandemic. We looked at different zones of how people traveled to the downtown St. Pete area and where they're coming from. So from the neighboring counties and parts of Pinellas County, as well as specific locations, we have these things called pass-through zones set up where we can see how people are actually accessing the downtown area. We did this for weekdays and weekends, and we looked at two times of year, one in the spring break time in March and another in September to give us a bigger picture as uh, how people travel. And we've been using this information to help us develop and evaluate projects. As part of our process, we will be doing three different scenarios that we'll be modeling. A large part of our effort is a modeling exercise to see what happens if we make changes to things like the one-way pairs and the spurs of the interstate system. We'll also be looking at other projects, but these are the ones that we're focused on at this point in time, and we are going to be evaluating them across a range of performance measures. Some of them will be model performance measures like travel time, and others will be related to economic development, livability, and safety as well. And so we started with an initial list of projects that we developed for a first scenario of modeling. We evaluated them and are just now working on the projects in scenario two to model them as well. Once we have the results from both scenarios, we're going to be doing a robust public outreach effort. We anticipate we'll be ready to do some outreach in May, but really most of it in June. And we'll use that public outreach to help us develop that third model scenario along with the results that we see from the first two. We'll then evaluate those projects and scenarios all together and come up with an action plan with next steps. Here's just a look at what we're looking at with the different concepts. And these 
Not all of these will be modeled, but it's some of what we've been considering throughout our process. And so these are all for I-175, looking at where we add new streets, where we change one-way streets, what new development opportunities or land will be available with these changes. And I'll walk through some of them. So you could see one scenario, there are different concepts with ramps, another one looking at conversions, and then they continue. And so some of these will be more of a boulevard concept. Some will be shortening of the interstate and we're looking at this different range. Here you can see scenario one, some of the major projects we're looking at. Again, the 375 and 175 spurs along with the one-way pairs. We are not looking at changes to First Avenue North or South because of the BRT project and the work that's already happening, we're focused on some of the other one-way pairs. And as I mentioned, all of our projects and scenarios we measured against these performance measures of safety, a vibrant and livable community, accessible and connected, and multimodal. So right now we're analyzing the scenario one performance and developing scenario two and then we'll do that public outreach in June. And as a result, develop our third scenario, do more public outreach, and then develop the action plan with public feedback to prioritize projects. And here again is the website if you'd like to learn more about the project. And I can take any questions you have. Thank you, Sarah. Any comments or questions? Uh, Commissioner Seal. Just one thing, um, and it looks, it was interesting, the number of crashes that were on two-way streets versus one-way streets. Um, personal preference, I love the one-way streets, so um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I think when you, I, I wanted to make a comment about the two-way streets, too. I kind of go the other way. I mean, I like the ones I'm used to, but um, I just am curious about how it impacts retail. I have a friend of mine in retail who's like, you always want the bottom floor, and you want to be on a two-way street. So I just wonder, as St. Peter's were dealing with um, small businesses getting priced out of Central Avenue and Beach Drive, if we were able to have more of a two-way street system, we might have more blocks downtown that would suddenly become a lot more conducive to small business. But I'll let our data people give us the information to figure that out. Um, any other comments or questions? Well, thank you, Sarah, uh, for this report. I know the study is a, a very important first step before we would continue with anything else and that this is necessary before uh, any other subsequent actions would take place and certainly any PD&E studies. So um, thank you so much for this presentation. And I'm sure Council Member Gabbard and I will see this again soon at a city council near you. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you. Okay, let's, um, I think now I'm gonna turn things over to Wit for our director's report. Okay, I'll try to bring it on home pretty quickly here. Um, I, we, before they have to leave, I want the Department of Transportation to have an opportunity to answer a question that um, uh, Vice Mayor Murs posed uh, a while back uh, on the Olmerton Road um, segment between the Roosevelts um, as you're coming off I-275. And uh, Jensen told me that he had all the answers in hand and then Jensen uh, suddenly didn't show up, so maybe the answers aren't good. But uh, thank you for being here, I really appreciate it. <laughs> Yes, so once again, Justin Hall, Florida Department of Transportation, District 7. And first off, I just want to congratulate you. I didn't have a chance before when I came up for the, the win on the 2020 uh, uh, planning organization of the year. So that's something that's, that's very impressive. You know, statewide, there were a lot of submittals, and I know that there was a lot of competition for that. So hats off to this board and to WIT and staff, you know, for that win. Um, so Jensen did prepare me, so that's really good. And I'm looking at his notes, and he's like, as we discussed on Monday, which I didn't discuss on Monday, so I won't, I won't go into that kind of detail. But uh, we did review the typical section. We went back and reviewed the PD&E. And what it looks like is when we were looking at that typical section through their uh, federal highway, uh, gave us feedback that said that it needed to be a six-lane section, so three lanes through and through. 
and it looked like through analysis after the fact we looked and looked back and saw the opportunity to add auxiliary lanes between some of the intersections so we did um, and then we actually went back with our traffic operations looked at traffic analysis once again just a couple weeks ago and it appears that really what we're at right now is kind of an interim condition where the gateway expressway isn't opened but we've designed everything for the gateway expressway to be open and operational and so we're just kind of in a a middle ground and and for us to go back and seek approval for any kind of modifications beyond what we've done um, would be a little short-sighted being that we're so close to opening the gateway expressway and based on the traffic analysis once the expressway opens that'll operate at a level of service b which is i mean a really good level of service so it appears that we're just kind of in a kind of in a, a temporary condition middle ground where we just don't really have an ideal uh, traffic circulation through there, but part of it is because it's all been designed with that facility in mind. Um, and so, and, I, and I've, got the, I've got all the data and we can send it to you, you know, and, and we took a good look at it to see if there's anything else we could do, either signal timing or anything to try and resolve it between now and then. Um, but it, it appears that, that really there's not much we can do outside of what we've already done, you know, with the auxiliary lanes. So the concern that, that, I mean, I saw it already last Friday when I was coming off of the, 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 the flyover. And, um, you know, obviously the, the merging at that location um, is, is the concern. I saw, you know, I see it whenever I'm, I drive that road. And so, um, which, is, which is not as much because of COVID and whatnot working, yes, but, but obviously I see it building back up again. So the fact that uh, now there's like three lane or three blocks basically yes, that sir. is that short spot. So uh, what is the alternative to, to, to be able to extend a lane through those, that three block area? There looks like there's sufficient yeah. um, uh, easement available i think that's the federal approval you know because we have an approval for a typical section based on the pd and e and so that would require us going out and reevaluating that corridor but from what we're seeing from the traffic analysis once the gateway expressway opens up that necessity for that additional lane won't be needed based on the change in traffic pattern so in it, it all it all comes from the mode shift or i guess not really the mode shift but the um um the route that people choose to travel. And so when we look at our traffic data, we're not just looking at a micro scale, we also look at a macro scale. And so it just appears that once the Gateway Expressway is open, there will be trips that will divert from that route to the alternate route. And so we won't see the same condition once it opens. And then we've got a commitment from our traffic operations department that if when it opens here in a few months, if we still see that, then we will go back out and reevaluate it. But if it performs the way we're seeing it based on the model, then there shouldn't be a concern here in a few months. And we, we drove through it today, so I, I know exactly what you're talking about. But um, it, it just appears right now we're just in a, in a temporary condition, you know, pending the Gateway Expressway opening. Well, I, I don't want to obviously beat a dead horse and ruin, uh, extend too much, but I, I've been driving that route for 22 years, and, and there's always been two lanes merging into one. And I've seen Omerton grow and grow and grow and grow, and it always ends up when it grows that that one lane is always a partial. Yes, sir. And so um, I don't know about the gateway. Um, it, it still seems to me as you're going to, unless there's a change, you're, you're, you're still having two lanes of traffic coming off and basically the right lane stopping or having to merge in and then the cars on the other side and the three lanes are merging in and at that location there's just a you know a lot and i don't know about the gateway yeah how that is going to stop the fact that you've got two lanes merging into one i think we're anticipating a shift from traffic that's coming that far into that olmerton you know flyover further to the i guess that would be the south or southwest there'd be a transition so you know when people get off of 275 and they have that decision point where they continue on down olmerton or they go the gateway is now an additional choice as part of that and i think what they're seeing is that there'll be some people that'll choose to take that route as opposed to coming on down through the flyover and merging in and mm -hmm. i mean that's that, like i said that's that's what I, it's being explained to me and, and we can go back and look at it again but that that's the way it's explained is that with a new choice, with a new facility, that some of those trips are gonna to divert to that route. 
can you commit that, that, you know, when the Gateway Expressway opens, that you'll do uh, an operations analysis to kind of look at that weaving and merging issues? Because I think that's really the concern that he's expressing is um, there's a lot of people trying to shift over to go fast, and they're, and they're stuck in a lane where they can't go fast. Yep. And then there are a lot of people wanting to get in that lane yep. who can't find a gap to get in that lane today. And I think that's the concern. Yeah, the, the mixing there is a problem. And I, and I think we recognize that there's a problem there. I just, I think that we believe we have the solution when the gateway opens. And if, if that's not the case, then we would be committed to fit, you know, looking into how we can fix that problem operationally. And the timing of the gateway completion, remind me, I thought it was early 2022. Yeah, it's, it, do you know the, you know the opening date for gateway? Yeah, I think it's, I think we have like a little over a year left of this uh, temporary condition is what I'm, was explained to me, so. Thank you. Good to see you today. See you. Um, I certainly share in those same concerns. I drive that a lot for business, personal reasons, and it is a mess through there, especially at rush hour. So I certainly support uh, Commissioner Mertz there in that um, conversation as well. I actually wanted to bring up something else, if I could, sure. while we have you. Sure. Um, and it is part of the informational items that are in our backup. Uh, I wanted to thank WIT for putting together the letter regarding regarding the Complete Streets project in uh, St. Petersburg along 34th Street um, on 58th South and 28th mm -hmm. Avenue area. So there's a lot of concern about some changes that have been made or approved since um, a lot of the community promises were made about okay. this project, uh, specifically some of the right-hand turn lanes that have been approved that were not part of the original design, and it is starting to impede, if you will, on those larger sidewalks. And so I just wanted to um, state my support for Witt's letter that he wrote and ask that we try to realize those commitments that were made to the community and that any changes that will be made will be discussed thoroughly with Forward Pinellas, City of St. Pete, Skyway Marina District, making sure that we really hold true to the spirit of that complete street project. Yeah, and I, you know, Witt and I have had several conversations on this, and, and we've we've met internally on that as well, and and that's a really complex corridor. Um, you know, we did look at the right turn lanes to see if the right turn lanes were the problem with sidewalk width, or were there other issues, and it and it appears the majority of the locations where we have to constrain the sidewalk, it's actually utility, not right turn lane. Okay. I believe there was one right turn lane where there was an issue with the sidewalk, so it was only one. Uh, where that caused, uh, that was the reason why the sidewalk was being necked down. Uh, we did secure uh, um, easements from several of the property owners so that if there is a right turn lane, we can still uh, bring a 10 foot sidewalk through. And you know, obviously the 10 foot sidewalk is something that originally was, I think it was like about a million dollar mm -hmm. addition. And I think right now we're running to about 5.4 million uh, for the 10 foot wide sidewalk. So, I mean, that definitely is a, a large item on the project that, you know, it, the utilities are the big thing, and I know there's been a lot of conversations on the utilities, so I, you know, I won't, I won't get into that. And then we've also been working. Uh, I talked to Wit about this about uh, lowering the speed limit out there, and then also uh, we're committed to, and I know that we're going to submit a letter back to Wit, you know, so you guys have it, you know, formally documented. But uh, to come back after the bat lanes are in place or the business access, access transit lanes are in place, uh, to take a look at what the condition is of the corridor at that point and see if we can even lower the speed limit even more. So okay. uh, we're committed to working on that corridor and, and that's something that we'll commit to in a letter. Um, I don't think that many of those decisions were made in a vacuum. I just don't think that, you know, I think they could have been communicated a little clearer. Okay. I think that's really where the, the shortfall was there. That's my two cents on that. But so. Well, thank you. We appreciate working with you as always and uh, just can continue to keep us apprised of what's going on with that very important project. Definitely will do. Thank you. Good Absolutely. to see you. Good to see you. I'm pretty comfortable with the partnership and next steps. So okay. I'll let you know if I'm the, thank I'll you. let them know if I'm the. <laughs> More importantly. <laughs> okay. Um, if I could just quickly go down the spotlight emphasis areas and um, I uh, just want to let you know that we did have a uh, March 26 Gateway Partnership meeting for the uh, the Gateway area, and I thought that was really good. Christina led that meeting where we um, had a discussion about uh, performance measures and reporting, 
uh, and um, how we'll evaluate success in the gateway area. So um, I thought we had a really good uh, foundation for that. Uh, and we are rolling that ongoing implementation into the new spotlight emphasis area. Uh, the Waterborne Transportation Committee met on April 2nd. Many of you here in the room were there. Uh, in addition to making the recommendation that we add the Clearwater Ferry to the priority list, um, see I said it again, Mayor, um, that will be considered in your May uh, agenda packet. Uh, the committee heard from PSTA on a very detailed um, analysis of how they need to, what they need to consider to integrate waterborne transportation into PSTA bus operations. Uh, and everything from fair policy to, um, you know, service levels to um, accommodating people who walk and bike. Uh, and it, it's pretty complex. And I really want to give a lot of credit to PSTA and Cassandra Borchers in particular for thinking through all these issues. Because when you start dealing with operations, you're dealing with a whole lot of moving parts and variables. And um, if we want waterborne transportation to be successful and not just be a one-off novelty, then integrating it into PSTA is absolutely essential. It also opens up some revenue streams that they haven't been able to have access to as a private operator. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and what we're going to do on the timeline for that is we're going to have a meeting likely in the summer and then a final meeting of the committee in the fall with the goal of uh, recommending to the Ford Pinellas Board a system plan uh, that would be phased that we would adopt into the long range transportation plan to give it standing uh, and wait for additional funding. So that's um, sort of the next steps on that. Um, the aerial gondola feasibility study, just wanted to let you know that T-Barta reported to me that they have selected a consultant. Uh, they've had preliminary negotiations with that consultant and they expect a notice to proceed to be issued um, sometime this month is my understanding. Um, they may not get started until May or, or, or June, but uh, that, should, that work should be coming uh, soon. And they'll be focusing on downtown Clearwater to Clearwater Beach and in the downtown St. Petersburg area, looking at specific um, alignments uh, for a potential aerial gondola. Uh, and that's been a long time coming. And Ford Pinellas was part of the selection committee and uh, we'll be on the study management team in partnership with T-Barta for that. So it's a, it's a collegial effort. Uh, and you've already mentioned the 34th Street South Complete Streets uh, resurfacing project. The letter is in the packet for that. This will be our next bus rapid transit corridor, um, all, uh, if all goes well. The department, uh, it, they're considering the bat lanes on 34th Street, the business access and transit lanes to be still an experimental treatment um, and this will be the first time they've been applied on a state road in Pinellas County. And um, so they want to evaluate how it looks once it's up and running. We feel that it's redundant to have the right turn lanes and a business access transit lane, because that's like two right turn lanes mm -hmm. in parallel. Um, but I understand their rationale. And if we can look back at it a year after the bat lanes are open and operating, we may find that we don't need those right turn lanes. Um, I think they're, they could present a safety hazard, potentially. Um, and then finally, uh, the board discussion on the frontage roads and uh, the workshop on the innovative intersection concepts. Uh, we are going to be bringing the frontage roads analysis uh, at our May meeting. And then we were thinking that um, either June or July, we would have the recommendation um, uh, for the board to consider. But I know Commissioner Seal's not going to be here in July, so we may want to look at June if, if we can turn that around quickly. But it'll be two, two presentations because there's a lot on the frontage roads, and I want you to have two opportunities to kind of digest it and then make a recommendation at the second one. And it's not time sensitive, so if we need to push it back to September, uh, we'll do so. For the innovative intersection concepts, we haven't picked a date, uh, but we're looking at September probably for that workshop and that'll just focus on the innovative intersection concepts for those northern intersections. Um, and in the meantime, we are gearing up some community outreach that will um, try to um, just get some sense of where the businesses and adjacent homeowners and residents in the nearby area, what their thoughts are and concerns and considerations are for that area. Um, I like the surveys we did for our Vantage Pinellas plan where we ask people to weigh in on some different ideas and 
we'd like to have that information available when we bring that to the workshop so that you can hear from what the public is saying about the, the corridor. And I'll open it up for any questions on any of those items. All right. Uh, the legislative committee met uh, earlier today and we went through the litany of bills, good and bad, uh, that we're tracking in Tallahassee. Uh, in your agenda packet, you have a couple of letters of opposition. Seems like we're writing a lot of letters <laughs> of opposition these days uh, to the um, rectangular rapid flashing beacons and mid-block crossings and for uh, the building design bill. Um, We've been active um, statewide on these issues and uh, gotten a lot of media coverage from Bay News 9 and uh, ABC Action News and, and other outlets. And I've been, I've been also talking with some of the lobbyists from around the state representing different cities uh, and counties uh, who are concerned about these same items. I uh, don't think there's anything else from the legislative committee unless you feel like there's something you want to bring up. No, I mean, we had a good conversation at the end of the meeting about just kind of how we move forward into the future sessions and possibly kind of maybe looking at things a little differently in a more proactive approach. Uh, so talked about, you know, maybe reconvening after the summer and, and talking about how we can be more positive in our response and work better with our delegation ahead of time so we're not always just being reactive to things. Uh, so I think that's a, a good plan and uh, we look forward to bringing you more about that in the future. We talked about having the committee maybe meet uh, in August or even July to think about what might be some priorities that we can advance in Tallahassee as opposed to playing defense and, yeah. and maybe convening the different government affairs staff around the county for that. Uh, finally, last item I just want to mention, we had a really successful Bike Your City event in March. Credit to Angela and Amy and other staff members who participated, Maria. Uh, they did a great job. We had over a thousand electronic submissions for the scavenger hunt um, that we did. And this was not centered on one jurisdiction. So this was Bike Your Own City throughout the county. We had a Tuesday trivia uh, where we awarded prizes for people who guessed correctly. Uh, these were all transportation related themes and answers. The scavenger hunt, people had to identify transportation treasures around the county. Um, and then we had a community art project um, that um, we partnered with the Safety Harbor Art and Music Center on. And we had a lot of participation from bike shops around the county. So that was just great. Um, and this is an educational effort. So I just really like these things. I think they work well and they, they broaden uh, people's view on things. And last, I'll just mention uh, what Justin said. We were awarded Organization of the Year at Transplex uh, by the Florida Department of Transportation. Um, I think a Safety Harbor resident, a former planner, Lorraine <laughs> Suarez, um, submitted our application, but um, we really you know, appreciate that. And um, I, I don't know much about the details of how we were selected. I know we didn't toot our own horn, but it's nice to be recognized. And, Thank you all board because you're part of our success, but I really want to thank our staff too because we have a great staff and they make my job very easy. Were we nominated or did we get it? We were nominated and then we were awarded. That um, is so great. We, we are organization of the year. That is fantastic. There's you're, a press release that went out today. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're being way too humble. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have, okay. unless you want to cover anything on informational items. Well, I have um, another thing I wanted to talk about. It would probably be about another hour. Okay. So, um, or we could adjourn. It's not five yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for this, for being here, and uh, we will adjourn. Thank you. Thank you.